Okay, welcome everybody to this new edition of uh, the workshop on uh, heterogeneous and low power data center technologies. Uh, my name is Alberto Scionti. I'm a senior researcher in uh, the Leaks Foundation, uh, that is a research center located in Turin, Italy. And uh, I'm uh, also one of the co organizers of, of this workshop. Uh, the other one is uh, Mr. Terzo. Um, he's also uh, part of the Lynx Foundation, but uh, um, uh, today he, he, he will not uh, join the, the workshop, uh, unfortunately. Um, let me spend a few words uh, about um, uh, the workshop itself. Uh, this is the fourth edition um, of the workshop. Uh, we started uh, in the 2018 with a workshop program that was uh, uh, mainly inspired by, at the time, our involvement in the um, uh, European project uh, called OPERA, um, where uh, basically uh, we, we, we selected uh, as for the program uh, mainly topics related to data center low power um, uh, technologies from the hardware, um, the hardware uh, perspective. Since then, we tried to intercept the interests uh, and the hot topics uh, that basically orbit around uh, uh, data centers, uh, mainly in terms of new technologies and solutions uh, which are able to make uh, uh, data center greener than uh, they, they were in the past. Um, last year, uh, we also started to catch up uh, um, the attention of the HPC community by bringing uh, with the, within the workshop uh, the experience uh, matured by the uh, H2020 ICT11 projects. Uh, basically, Lexis, Sibel, uh, Evolve, and DeepHealth. And this year, we want to see progresses from, from them, basically. So let me share my pleasure to be here uh, for this new exciting uh, edition of the, our workshop. Of, co of course, we hope to continue to bring uh, on the discussion table new topics, enlarge the community attending uh, year after year uh, the workshop, and try to see what uh, there will be in the next uh, future in terms of uh, technologies and uh, uh, ideas uh, and solutions. Uh, and this year we try to achieve this with a uh, very interesting program. So I really hope to, you will enjoy the, the workshop. Uh, before starting, let me share the main program for uh, today. Um, we will start with uh, two talks. The first one will uh, provide the, the industrial vision on uh, moving technology uh, towards data center solutions, not only as cloud data center, but also from uh, the HPC uh, viewpoint. And uh, will be provided by Mr. Um, D'Amato from uh, Atos. Then we will uh, have a second talk provided by um, a representative of the Terogenity uh, Alliance. Uh, Mr. Um, uh, Jamé. Uh, as for the other, other workshop, um, we have a coffee break scheduled uh, um, at 11 in the morning and half past four in the afternoon. Lunch break will be followed by main keynote talk. Um, so don't forget uh, to join us uh, again. Uh, the other workshop presentations uh, are divided basically in uh, four sessions, uh, as you can see, uh, where representatives of the four main uh, H2020 ICT11 projects will share general and more technical progresses uh, uh, achieved so far. So again, uh, thank you for uh, being here and uh, enjoy the, the workshop. I think we can start uh, with the um, presentation from uh, Mr. D'Amato. We should be live with the presentation. Um, okay. So, 
Hi everyone, uh, I'm Ingmar D'Amato and I work at Atos in the Italian branch as a HPC, AI and quantum computing solution architect. I want to thank the, the, the Leeds Foundation for the invitation to this workshop, specifically Mr. Terzo and Mr. Scionti, but it is my first time at HIPIC and very happy to be here. And with me being grateful for the opportunity, uh, I shall commence with the presentation, which will cover these three topics. A brief introduction to AITOS and supercomputing in Europe, a few comments on um, our efficiency and decarbonization, and we'll finish off with our quantum computing program. With this talk, I will address the main topics of the, of the workshop that are low power systems and uh, heterogeneity in the data center. The, the latter through the lenses of our quantum computing program, where we really have a lot to say in this field, and I'll be happy to guide you through our program, which will be the main and conclusive part of this talk. So uh, let me start introducing the company I work for. Uh, Atos is a global company. Uh, we are leader in digital transformation with a European heart, heart, heart <laughs> headquartered in Beson, France, uh, where every day uh, we, so uh, 110,000 people, colleagues in distributed in over 73 countries are developing and implementing innovative digital solution to support uh, the business transformation of thousands of our clients. Um, we are also quoted in the French stock exchange with an annual revenue of uh, uh, 12 billion euros. But how does EDOS, leader in digital transformation, relates to big data, HPC, uh, the convergence between big data and HPC, edge computing and quantum computing? Well, thanks to the acquisition of Bull Technologies in 2014 that allowed us to enter in the supercomputing and HPC, so uh, high performance computing uh, market. And this has been a key priority since then. And now, uh, in 2021, Atos has become a leading company in designing, developing, and manufacturing servers in Europe. To keep it concise, we've achieved some important milestones throughout these six, now seven years. Uh, we've reinvested a substantial amount of the revenue in our 18 uh, research and development um, centers worldwide. And we've allocated more than 3,000 people uh, dedicated to our research and development programs and projects uh, with two supporting communities uh, um, that are the scientific and the um, expert communities. We've also maintained and grown our partnership with uh, best-in-class chip manufacturers in order to deliver excellence in, in HPC for both our private and public clients in Europe and in the rest of the world. We say that with some of our clients who trust, uh, who trust us with our expertise in parallel computing, we founded Center of Excellence, 12 in total to be exact. Uh, a few excellence are the Center of Excellence in Life Sciences at Cambridge University, which is the point of reference for our numerous HPC activities. Uh, not only that, also for uh, intel artificial intelligence and quantum activities um, all over Europe. And uh, also, another example is the Center Excellence with the uh, ECMWF, uh, which is the European Center for Mid-Range Weather Forecast. Uh, to, this, this center was founded to uh, enhance, uh, study how to enhance HPC weather forecast and uh, climate change simulation with AI and quantum computing. And this center of excellence will become active very soon. We are also proud to say that in HPC specifically, we have a few European firsts. Uh, we are number one European player in HPC. We are also number one European player in weather forecast, having delivered best-in-class HPC systems in the most prominent and important weather forecast facilities and centers like Meteo France, DKRZ, and ECMWF, to name a few. Uh, you can find them in the bottom right-hand corner uh, if you can see them. Um, another addendum uh, is that in Italy, I'm proud of that, we are planning to become officially number one for HPC computing power installed uh, after the delivery of the data center Leonardo, which was uh, uh, lot three of the Euro HPC tender. And the system will be installed in the premises of the Cineca Research Center near uh, Bologna in Italy. It's also worth mentioning that we are uh, at the forefront of development of uh, European exascale systems. We have leadership, 
leadership position uh, in initiatives such as uh, PPI for HPC, RACE, uh, and the European Processor Initiative. Not only that, we are also partner of many projects funded by the European Union in the field of supercomputing um, in several areas of expertise ranging from uh, climate modeling simulation for weather forecast to uh, solid earth simulation. So also not only for the hardware, but for, for an application, also from an uh, these were uh, several Horizon 2020 projects, and we will see uh, what will happen with uh, uh, Horizon Europe in the in the future. Now, I will briefly guide you through the latest top 500 issue because uh, with it I want to touch the second topic of the talk, that is uh, power efficiency and decarbonization. At a glance, we have 31 system in top 500, with our first system being in the seventh position worldwide. We're also number three for system installed, for number of system installed in Europe. And we are the top contributor for the latest list, uh, or the latest top 500 list of, uh, of November, as we added five new systems uh, to the list. These among other things. Um, but our first system, the Ulich uh, booster, it's the most powerful system in Europe. And it's also first in top 100 green, as well as top three in uh, top 500 green. For those who are not familiar with it, uh, the top 500 green is the list of the most energy efficient systems and the Ulich booster installed at the, at the, in the premises of the Ulich Research Center in Germany performs 25 gigaflops uh, per watt on high performing impact, as well as uh, 44.1 uh, petaflop sustain. Now, with the, the Ulich Research Center, we have uh, a long history. And for this particular system, we co-designed it together with the client to target a desired performance per gigawatt from an application point of view. And this result is an important statement for us because roughly 25% of the total cost of ownership of a data, a data center comes from uh, energy. Thus, be becoming, becoming extremely efficient uh, is key for both the roadmap to exascale computing, our client, and uh, also the, the planet. Now, fear not, I will not illustrate the feature of our product, but I want to say that um, the manifestation of our effort in developing energy efficient systems is our flagship high-end uh, direct liquid cool <laughs> system, the Bullsequan XH2000. It's an all-in-one rack system. It's optimized for many things, but most importantly for the total cost of ownership. Um, the blades are hot pluggable and has a lot of other features uh, that are interesting, but are not relevant for this talk. The important thing I wanted to highlight is that the, with the XH2000, the Bullsequan XH2000, we are able to ensure ultra high energy uh, efficient performances. And we are, we are trying to target a challenging PUE very close to one. That is the theoretical maximum. And on top of that, we have other optional smart energy saving software like the Bull Dynamic Power Optimizer and the Bull Energy Optimizer that are uh, able to enhance uh, performance, the, the application performances. And I think that uh, with the Ulich Booster, we made a statement for the power efficiency of our systems. And there will be more to come. We have uh, other clients who chose uh, our solutions also thanks to the power efficiency of our systems. And among them, there is the ECMWF, again, the European Center for Mid-Range Weather Forecasts. And uh, uh, we are particularly proud for, for, for of this accomplishment because one of their main research area uh, will be climate change and being able to deliver our best-in-class systems to help leading research centers and researchers to tackle real-world problems is a good feeling. Climate change is an important topic for Atos. Uh, not only we've been carbon neutral since 2018, but we're doing our part in this global interconnected society we live in, in signing the Climate Pledge and aim for net zero carbon emissions uh, by 
um, this means that we are going to neutralize uh, our, all our all, all the carbon uh, under our influence, including also suppliers and partners. Uh, now, the, the scope of this intent is uh, way larger than, uh, than ATOTS itself, and it's also fully 15 years ahead of the Paris Agreements um, for the for the 2050 deadline. And you'll see in the very near future how we are going to be able to bring decarbonization in the data centers. Um, I also want to share the words and the work of the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, in 2018, Paul Romer, uh, that states that it's the society's burden to focus on the right innovation, such as focusing on reducing our energetic and carbon footprint. And I like to think that we're doing our part in supplying researchers uh, the right tools to help innovation come this way as part of, of uh, this global inter interconnected society. <clears throat> Luckily, uh, this sustainable vision is also shared from some of our clients who are also focusing on decarbonization, like Total, that has also signed a pledge for uh, a net zero operation by 2050. Uh, with Total, we have a long history of collaboration, who, among other things, co-chairs our QLM user club, our quantum learning machine uh, user club since 2019, and I'll comment this uh, later. Um, and and prior to that, since uh, 2018, uh, Total is using uh, our quantum simulator, ATOS QLM, that enables Total to study and explore how quantum computing can tackle a very complex problems, such as modeling molecules for carbon capture. <coughs> modeling modeling uh, simul simulating molecules is uh, uh, a very taxing uh, process uh, nowadays um, and, and it, it, it can be sometimes uh, intractable with current computing capabilities and the results are very interesting. If you want some more information I'll leave a, a YouTube link where you can hear directly uh, the works from uh, Elvira Shishenina who led this work uh, so it's for you to, if you want to delve deeper and learn all the insights. And it might be interesting in learning why they picked the, the imaginary time evolution algorithm over the variational quantum angle solver that is used usually when you want to simulate uh, molecules. And uh, okay, now uh, with, the, with this change of background, I will introduce the last topic of this talk, that is the ATOS quantum program. Uh, its mission is to enable people or scientists to develop and experiment with quantum application and algorithms before a fully fledged quantum computer is ready. It all started in 2016 when we started investing heavily in our quantum research and development program. And since the very beginning, Atos has adopted an hard diagnostic approach. Uh, this was decided by our scientific advisory board that you can see in the picture. And this hardware agnostic choice is reflected in the support of different quantum systems, such as superconductors, ions, and neutral atoms. Now, the ADOS Quantum Scientific Advisory Board helped us navigate uh, in this complex uh, quantum computing world. And we, we invited some of these, uh, some of them, world most famous and, and talented expert in the field of quantum computing, mathematics and physics to join our board. Um, in the middle, you can see our CEO, Elie Girard, uh, that chairs the scientific advisory board with our group CTO, which is uh, Sophie Proust, and our group director of quantum research and development, that is uh, Cyril Alouche. Um, and you might, uh, of course, recognize some of these uh, world-renowned scientists. Uh, a tiny bit of history. Quantum computing has been around since uh, the 80s and has re-emerged around 2010 as we enter the so-called NISC era. NISC stands for uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum computers that are affected by noise, are also present only a limited amount of qubits uh, ranging from hundreds to thousands with constraints on topology and connectivity. Uh, but there are already some useful um, algorithms and applications that benefit these NISC devices uh, with promising results. Um, in ETHOS, we, we see quantum computing as an accelerator of classical computing, and it's not likely that the latter will replace uh, anytime soon, will be replaced anytime soon by uh, quantum computing. 
we believe that quantum processing units will join the data centers as another accelerator, like GPUs, FPGAs, and ASICs did and are doing, or uh, we will see how, how this goes. And but I'll be back to, to I'll, co I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this uh, very soon because using quantum processors in the data center or as a, in a, an HPC environment is part of our glo global five pillar strategy. Uh, next step will be the full toler full the tolerant uh, quantum computing era. Uh, but we still have some time um, for that to happen as a full tolerant quantum computer is expected to come in many years. And in the scientific community, uh, there are still debates on exactly when that will be. But where do we as EDOS uh, stand in this timeline? You can see it. So uh, as mentioned earlier, in 2016, uh, it was the year where it all started. Uh, the year after uh, came out our our first quantum product, which is the ATOS QLM, our simulator. Then throughout uh, 2018 and 2019, we developed a software addition to the QLM, introducing a noise model, which is tunable and allows you to introduce different types of noise related to different types of hardware technologies. We've uh, launched MyQLM, which is our free simulator, downloadable on any personal computer. We've also announced the QLM User Club, and again, I'll explain better later what this club does. Last year, in 2020, we added some hardware and software addition to our QLM, uh, that are the QLM-E, that is enhanced, uh, that allow for more variational, more variational algorithms to be run in parallel. Now, variational algorithms are the algorithms that target the NISC devices available today. Because the way we interact with the quantum processor does not require error correcting schemas with these uh, uh, variational algorithms. Um, still, doesn't mean that quantum computation runs smoothly because there, there are a few other challenges like the problem of a vanishing radiance or another interesting challenges. Uh, again, we also launched the new software feature that expands our combinatorial optimization offering and brings quantum simulated uh, annealing capabilities and can target up to 5,000 variables. Um, then this year, uh, we are launching the QLM as a service, uh, and this for existing customers will be accessible directly from MyQLM. So stay tuned for, for that. And the most exciting thing for, for me is that in 2023, we release our own quantum accelerator as part of our five pillar strategy, where we want to build a next generation supercomputing architecture based on quantum accelerator. But what exactly is our five pillar strategy? It can be summarized as we're going to, we're providing a quantum programming platform. We are also providing quantum expert consulting services to assist and guide our customer to discover uh, this new technology and, and guide them See how, how to apply it to their specific needs. And uh, our services range from an introduction to quantum computation to a uh, full uh, proof of concept with our clients. Uh, we are also investing in next generation architectures. Uh, we, are, we are both helping partners to improve their, technology, their hardware technology, as well as building our own quantum accelerator. And we will add it in our portfolio by 2020. Of course, this will be a NISC uh, accelerator. We are also developing in-house expertise uh, on quantum algorithms, more specifically oriented to variational algorithms, uh, which are, are beneficial in this NISC era. And as a cybersecurity company, we are also invested in research uh, in post-quantum safe, safe cryptography, both on the hardware and the software side. As a European player, we are very active in the field of quantum computation and with our expertise in both digital and analog quantum simulation, we help uh, uh, many European funded programs. I'll briefly explain the difference between digital and analog quantum computation. With digital quantum computation, the evolution of your system is described by a quantum circuit 
made of quantum gates. You've, prob you've probably seen uh, this representation already, where we have our initial set of qubits that represent uh, our quantum system. And then with these gates, we interfere with the system via this circuit to control the evolution of the system. In this case, uh, we are entangling these two qubits to, and we are creating this so-called bell state, or as someone famous called it, uh, some sp spooky action at a distance. Now, this digital approach uh, is more universal, it's more generalized, is more abstract, but is more prone to error. And thus, to, it, it, will, it will require a large num, amount of qubits and error correcting schemas. Then on the other side, we have analog quantum computation, uh, where the, evolu the evolution of the system is not controlled by a circuit, but by a sequence of Hamiltonians that can be tuned in a continuous manner. This is similar to the adiabatic approach, where you drive your system from an initially known ground state to the ground state of the final Hamiltonian. And that, that final Hamiltonian will be the solution of our problem. So to put it simply, you control the evolution from the, of the system from one point to one other in a quantum fashion. This is not universal, but is less prone to error. Where do we help uh, in, the, in, the, in Europe with our expertise in this field? Uh, well, we are coordinator and member of the NISC project that aims to prepare uh, European businesses for uh, the quantum computing age that comes with the NISC devices that are out now and will be available in the future. We are also leader of application of the Pasquans project uh, that aims to create uh, both a new neutral atom and an ion-based quantum simulator simulation platforms up to 500 uh, atoms or qubits. Also, uh, with action, Atos' commitment is uh, to develop a true 50 qubit quantum accelerator before 2023. So again, these are uh, just three of the projects we are involved in uh, quantum computing in Euro at, at a uh, European level. I also wanted to share this infographic that is uh, that comes from a famous report uh, from Le Lab Quantique, uh, and this research shows the number of patents held by organization in quantum computing. Now, with 12 patents published, we are number one in Europe and number 24 worldwide. And the majority of the patent, patents is held by uh, the US and China. And if we want to compete in this quantum world, we need, as Europe, to increase uh, the effort in uh, this regard. But we, we can do it. Now, after mentioning uh, it many times, let me give you a quick uh, overview of our quantum computing offering that revolves around our quantum simulator, that is the ADOS QNM. Now, this platform allows the users to, to, to write their, their, their quantum algorithms in a hardware agnostic way. So they can only focus on the task the algorithm must perform. And then, depending on the, technology, the hardware technology the user wants to target, it's possible to use our optimizer to adapt their code in to specific constraints, topology or noise, that is, that are linked with the targeted hardware. This, uh, this way, we enable our users to experiment and develop their quantum application on the widest range of quantum technologies, avoiding uh, technology lock-ins. Um, We also provide a noise modeling tool to help users evaluate the impact of quantum noise on the results of their simulations. Um, we offer advanced simulation capabilities up to 41 qubits, uh, these with maximum constraints using our Linux simulator, or up to hundreds and even thousands of qubits with other simulation models. So, for instance, if you want to run a low entangled circuit with a, with a set number of Clifford gates, then the number of qubits for that specific simulation can increase significantly. And our simulator can help with that. Uh, very interesting uh, is that uh, the ATOS QLM has already been used uh, as a front end for an actual QPU, uh, like superconducting qubits, or uh, QPU is a quantum processing unit, uh, like superconducting uh, or trapped ion uh, ones. 
uh, this through some of our research and development partnerships and uh, also customers around the world. Um, another, another offer that we have is the QME, where E stands for Enhanced. And uh, the announcement comes from the GPUs that are natively supported on our platform. And it can strongly accelerate uh, many variational algorithms in parallel. This means that uh, we are able to accelerate up to 12 times uh, the simulations. Uh, to every QLM model in a range of 30 to 40 qubits uh, exists the enhanced version uh, with GPUs. You can upgrade, uh, you, you can upgrade it. Um, MyQLM is our free simulator and consists in the same programming environment as the QLM. And it's based on, a Python, on Python uh, and contains uh, open source models, which are a linear algebra simulator called PyLinalg, and also connectors uh, with other existing quantum programming environments like Google's or IBM's. And MyQLM allows users to launch simulation directly from their personal computers uh, up to 20 qubits. And again, it's free. Uh, so, so if you want to start uh, playing around. <laughs> Um, our solution was the platform of choice of a few leading research centers and clients around the world that benefit from our uh, advanced simulation features. And some of these clients, uh, if not all of them, are um, also part of our QLM user club that was announced in 2019 and is co-chaired by uh, Harry Kalenda from Total and Travis Humble from the Oak Ridge National Laboratories. Now, this user group was created to foster synergies between ADOS QLM users for sharing privileged information, and also for us to get uh, direct feedback from the users. Um, to join the QLM user club, uh, user club uh, there is an application open for various membership position uh, levels uh, open to all our customers. And let me introduce now, uh, as the last topic of this uh, of this talk, um, that is uh, Q score. We announced this uh, uh, in December 2020, and we are very excited about it. So, in short, uh, it's our quantum benchmarking tool. It's free, and it will not have the ADOS name before it, and I'll explain why. It's also hardware agnostic, so it's not biased over one technology platform, superconducting or drop ion that is, and takes in account the computing speed of the QPU, of the quantum processing unit, when performing certain tasks. The idea behind Q-Score uh, started from the consideration that the most powerful benchmarking tool in the quantum world studies the physical properties of the chip. Um, and, and we, with uh, Q-Score, on the other side, we propose Q-Score as a complement because our aim with Q-Score is to ultimately help a quantum chip manufacturer to assess how their QPUs perform on certain variational algorithms. All this in a comparable and universal and hardware agnostic way. Um, so what we believe is, uh, was needed for, for benchmarking the performance of a QPU was a strong scientific background, a real world connection with the application, and, and this application has to be scalable and has to evolve alongside the QPUs in the future, even long after the achievement of uh, the real world of supremacy is reached. And so our proposal was to define the benchmark as an operational challenge, not only studying the physical properties of the chip, uh, and then basically we took inspiration from the HPC benchmarking tool like high performance LIMPAC or HPCG computing gradients, uh, which are very easy in principle and in, in which there is just one challenge thrown at the computing machine. And there is one clock that measures how long does it take for the computation to be run. And QSCOR was built as a free tool accessible to quantum, to all quantum chip manufacturers to help uh, them increase their performances and bring stable QPUs. Again, it's free and we invite chip manufacturers to engage with us and with our R&D team to work things out. With this uh, uh, presentation, uh, uh, this has been a quick overview of the updates of the quantum program. So 
have left some things out for you to discover, like our combinatorial optimization offering. But I hope I gave an indication of uh, what is the direction uh, we are heading in terms of heterogeneity and power efficiency in the data centers. With this, uh, thank you again for your, your time. And I don't know how we'll, I will be able to answer your questions, uh, but I'll leave my email here for any inquiries. I also encourage you to visit our corporate website, uh, ados.net, uh, for, for more information. So again, thank you, thank you all, uh, Mr. Terzo, Mr. Shionti. I leave the virtual floor to you. Ciao. We can uh, some progress, and uh, uh, if someone of the attendees uh, or the panelists have some. Uh, Question for uh, Mr. D'Amato. Uh, we have a uh, few minutes uh, before next uh, presentation. Uh, I don't see any questions from in the chat. Okay. Um, well, the next, uh, um, uh, I have one question actually uh, before uh, moving uh, uh, for uh, Mr. D'Amato. Um, yes. I, I, I'm curious uh, um, about uh, uh, the, the ethos, uh, um, ethos uh, uh, standpoint in terms of uh, which uh, uh, which is uh, uh, for for Ethos the um, the the best uh, uh, hardware technologies for implementing uh, uh, quantum uh, processing unit. I mean, uh, um, as far as I know, that, uh, at the moment uh, um, a large number of different technologies uh, spanning from uh, ion traps, uh, um, Majorana fragments, or uh, uh, optical uh, optical system. So uh, I, uh, I would like to ask uh, the, 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 the best uh, or the, the most promising from, from your point of view. Well, I um, I don't think I personally can speak for Eidos um, because we, uh, as decided by the scientific the, by the scientific advisory board, um, we are taking this agnostic approach because uh, we think it's too early to double down on just one technology uh, because there are trade-offs to be, to be made when choosing one uh, hardware uh, technology uh, other than um, other, like if, if we go to superconducting qubits, uh, yes, gates are uh, more quick, uh, but there are problems with topology or uh, pro noise and error propagation if you have a, a, a very long circuit. Um, but if we have, I don't know, um, like um, uh, if we are trying to run a really long uh, circuit with millions of gates and we are going with a, an ion trapped quantum computer, a computation time will take uh, a lot of time because the, the gate speed is, uh, is yes, more, re re more reliable, robust, uh, but computation time for the gate uh, is longer. So there are trade-offs. Right now, in, the, in this NISC era, uh, <clears throat> since the circuits are uh, smaller because you run iteratively uh, as a relatively small circuit, um, you can, you know, like everyone has a chance between all the technology platform. But this is my view, eh? this is my view. Um, and uh, so um, we'll see, we'll see. We'll see uh, which technology will prevail in the future. I've seen also another question in, in the chat by Jean. Um, thank you. Uh, is there any ATOS plan to, uh, related to uh, the network, network technologies? Uh, yes, uh, we have uh, an offering uh, related to our, in, in our portfolio, which is the BXI, uh, which is the Bull Extreme Interconnect. 
Um, if you leave me an email, I can um, send you send you some some informa information in this regard. Uh, I'll be happy to do that. Just uh, the the last question uh, um, related to, to the this one. Uh, mm, do you know if uh, Ethos has uh, in the future plan uh, also some uh, quantum related uh, network technologies? Uh, I mean for. Uh, Cryptography or uh, supporting this kind of. Uh... Uh, in relay, uh, like, I cannot uh, answer this uh, uh, directly. Um, we are also focusing on uh, uh, quantum cryptography, uh, both on the hardware and the software level. Um, but uh, yeah, we're not. Uh, like we are not doing something like uh, Delft is doing, or or something, or what what China is doing with their uh, quantum networks, or not that I'm aware of. So uh, I, I can come back with this uh, reply when when I know more, <laughs> if I can tell you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thanks for uh, again, uh, Mr. D'Amato, for a uh, very interesting, um, I think, uh, uh, keynote. Uh, to open this fourth uh, edition of our um, uh, workshop. Uh, next talk uh, is from uh, Karim Jiman, the University of Leeds. Um, so, uh, Karim. Uh, yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to share my application. Uh, I so. I cannot share, I cannot start the screen share while the other participant is sharing. Let me try again. Yeah. Yeah, that is fine now. Can you see my screen? Yes. Sir. Yes. Yes, from my side. Right. Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Karim Jemam. I um, work at the School of Computing at the University of Leeds, and it's my uh, pleasure to be uh, with you uh, today to give you a, a talk on some research uh, we did uh, as part of a European uh, project called Tango. The title of the presentation is Energy Aware Self Adaptation for Application Execution on Heterogeneous Parallel Architectures. So, first of all, I would like to, to thank uh, uh, Alberto and uh, Olivier for uh, inviting me to give uh, this, uh, this, uh, this invited talk. Um, uh, last uh, couple of days, the uh, uh, bandwidth at home has not been great because there are so many people uh, on their laptops and mobile phones. Uh, the UK is in national lockdown and uh, there is no school education, but at home. So if uh, in the next couple of uh, uh, minutes, you will see me uh, um, um, dropping off or uh, maybe uh, turning off my camera, please bear in mind that it's very much about network resources not being there. Anyway, so uh, this, this work, especially this, uh, this, uh, this research has been made in collaboration with a number of colleagues, uh, Richard Kavanagh from the University of Leeds, uh, uh, um, colleagues from Barcelona Supercomputing Center, Rosa Badia and Jorge Yark, and, and also uh, a colleague from, uh, from Atos, uh, David uh, Garcia uh, Perez. Right, so I'll just start with giving you the research context, uh, very much how we, we actually started the, uh, the, the project and, and specifically, uh, focusing on an architecture and, and the self-adaptation uh, aspect in the, um, in, the, in heterogeneous uh, hardware environments. A bit motivation, maybe a quick word on the reference architecture. The self-adaptation itself, very much tailored towards the programming model runtime, some experiments and results and, and a conclusion. Right, so uh, the, the context here is, is, is very much about what we are all experiencing uh, these days or have been experiencing for a large number of years, we have seen a large number of applications uh, that we really define as disruptive applications. These are, uh, uh, for example, cyber physical systems or cyber physical systems of systems as we call them now, 
very quite complex, the Internet of Things, high performance computing, wearable computing, etc. So these are tend to have applications running on specific platforms. The platforms could be an HP, could be an old grid, could be a cloud, could be your mobile phone, could be any distributed infrastructure. And underlying all this is the support from the hardware. That's the heterogeneous architectures that we have certainly uh, seen uh, over the last few years that this actually became, became actually a jungle, a jungle in terms of the CPU, the multi-cores, the many cores, the GPUs, the, the, the FPGAs, the TPUs and all that. So many, uh, I would say a few years ago, there has been certainly a strong interest on how we, we should be able maybe to have mechanism or methods or potentially tools in order to design a more flexible software abstractions. And certainly the need for improved system architectures in order to full, fully exploit the benefits of this heterogeneity. And again, this heterogeneity comes at different levels, but also uh, uh, with, with, with the underlying hardware itself. Okay, so again, how do you make your life easy when you, can, when you, are, when you are a programmer or you need to design these kind of applications? So uh, we, we set up uh, about three, three years ago uh, an, an, an alliance called the Heterogeneity Alliance, which is very much uh, an, an, a, a forum where we bring organizations that are interested in technologies and tools related to heterogeneity in general, not only the hardware, but potentially the software the platform. So this idea was very much to say, at the end of the day, we want to bring everyone who has interest in constructing an application, deploying an application, running an application, and potentially optimize an application. And then the only thing that, well, and, and one as one, the two more as the, the two important aspects in re, uh, regarding to this is to keep in mind that performance is key, but, but also that these applications may be operating in a low power or a low energy environment. Therefore, with this organization in place, we brought academic, academic people, we brought a large number of research projects, for example, EU projects. We looked at open source initiative. We invited industry, industrial uh, partners who would be interested in giving us their, their, their input and potentially feedback on what we're doing. And there was also an, an interest in maybe moving to a standardization, anything that we feel was, was, could, could be part of a standardization. So the approach was very simple. It's top down from application to the programming model, to the middleware, potentially virtualization, and finally the hardware. Right, so, uh, in, other, in, so in addition to this, we, we, uh, we, we looked at uh, one aspect of the, of the, pro of the programming model which is to do with uh, programmers have their own way of, of designing and certainly writing their code, writing their applications. Sometimes the way they do it is pretty difficult and sometimes they are not even a computer scientist. Uh, it's very, very also difficult to understand what is going on during execution. So the runtime has usually some as uh, an, an important role to play and uh, by the way, if I have to run my application on a CPU or a, GP, or a GPU, is the GPU faster? Could it be faster, but at the same time going to, 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 uh, to consume more energy? Is it slower, but is it going to, to consume less energy? What would be, again, the aspect of efficiency, performance, and, sort, and certainly energy trade-off? So you could potentially tune your application for each architecture, CPU, GPU, potentially an FPGA, you can have to think about how you partition the data among the nodes. You may have to partition the tasks over the nodes. And also one important aspect that is, that is worth mentioning is, is again, is the data locality. And there's again, certainly an interesting, well, a research community looking again, looking specifically at this. So uh, we, we came up with this architecture uh, um, about four years ago. That's the Tongo architecture. We brought everyone together. We, we, we said, well, Let's take this top-down approach and bring, for example, the software designers and software engineers together, which they can bring an IDE and a programming model, potentially some form of tools where, where code can actually be profiled. We will then uh, looked at, again, how we can provide specific tools for modeling, designing, and constructing applications. And then comes the middleware application, 
very much how you can uh, construct your application and deploy it, place the application itself, the tasks, et cetera, and, and keep an eye on your, on your performance and your energy requirements, as well as the, the, the potential of these applications to run heterogeneous parallel architectures. Finally, expect again a third layer, which we see is as the fabric that's very much what really heterogeneous parallel device management is. So we, we, made, we made this architecture pretty, uh, I would say, uh, generic in the sense that this, this architecture has been, has been uh, certainly uh, uh, successfully uh, implemented in, 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 a number of, in a number of use cases, high performance computing and embedded systems, IoT, et cetera. So that's again very much a general generic refer, a reference architecture. So when you take this this architecture and you have an application that is deployed and running on an heterogeneous uh, environment, you would then expect to see that the that, that the, the, the the application itself would need to adapt to the environment where it runs. For example, as a, as as, a, as as an end user, I may favor energy uh, uh, and, and not performance, or may or vice versa. And therefore, I am aware that the environment where this application runs is likely to be dynamic, is likely to change. So the self-adaptation, uh, an adaptation that, again, uh, uh, adapts to the environment could be implemented either through the programming model itself or through the middleware. And in the middleware, we built specifically a new component called the self-adaptation manager, which, again, has to keep an eye on not only the energy consumed, but, but also performance. And this self-adaptation manager is again is a specific is is is, a, is generic enough to be able to be tuned and configured according to the the requirements from the end user. So this talk today, uh, the focus of this talk is about the programming model. So for the self-adaptation manager itself, that's a separate that's a separate research, and again, it is a separate talk. So my in the next few slides, I'm going really to focus on how the programming model itself supports self-adaptation. So uh, this, uh, obviously, uh, as you may have uh, guessed already, we have uh, we have been working with uh, with Barcelona Supercomputing Center for a number of uh, of, of years, and uh, and uh, and uh, what we, the, uh, the and the the uh, BSC <coughs> have their own uh, programming model. It's made of cons and 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 ohms as part of the stars. Expect an application. That will that will potentially bring its requirement, potentially bring uh, bring uh, bring in its uh, its data. But we would like again the program that we're going to uh, to be uh, to be designing and writing to be independent of the computing platform. So the so we would like we would like the programming model to be generic to be to be generic and so then will be hardware agnostic. Okay. So with a simple parallel programming model, I may have to specify to, to do, I may have a number of questions. How do I need to compute? What data do I need to use? Again programming model is there to help me do that. So the one important aspect of the, of the programming model that we have that been using is, is that it's actually task-based in, in the sense that expect the program to be decomposed in tasks, the parallelism inherent in the application is detected, the tasks are allocated to compute resources. So expect again the programming model to, to have a runtime where uh, the difficult parts, uh, the difficult parts in terms again of capturing the, the, the uh, the, uh, the, the parallelism, uh, 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 ensuring that there is there is a, a self adaptation uh, uh, automatically uh, in, in inherent in the application is there. You leave this part to the runtime itself. Okay? So give the power to the to the to the runtime. And by giving the power to the runtime, you've got intelligence, the parallelization, distribution, and the interoperability. Okay? All this again. Will be will uh, allow also the uh, the uh, comes as the requirements for the for the for the uh, for the programming model its runtime to be able to monitor and analyze what is actually going on during the actual executions. Therefore, we generate data to the, evaluate how the application uh, performs. Okay? So one important aspect of this is that the programming model is agnostic is is uh, hardware uh, agnostic. So again, a few words on the on the on stars. Uh, it comes with ohms and coms. Combs is is very much what we call uh, uh, what we call the the, the coarse grain uh, 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 coarse grain parallelism, where our, where our ohms is very much the the, the um, what we call the fine grain parallelism. If you look at this, the the task granularity in combs, it's it's about one hundred millisecond, whereas with, uh, with with ohms it could be one hundred microsecond up to one hundred milliseconds. So 
you could uh, look at the high level in terms of file and object in POMS and memory address space uh, as part of dependencies in, in POMS. Okay, so, and then think again, the coarse grain, how you distribute your application uh, to run on, on, on a heterogeneous architecture, and look at the intranode within your, uh, within your, uh, within your architecture. So again, think about two different kinds of, two levels of parallelism. So in order to do this, uh, the, you can take an application, think about uh, its main algorithm implemented as a workflow of, of coarse grain tasks and, and, and each coarse grain task in itself can be implemented as a workflow of fine grain tasks. Okay? So these, this, 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 this concept of workflow is, again is under the, uh, the, uh, is under the, the runtime uh, main operation. So one other aspect of this is task uh, versioning to enable the, the, the actual adaptation. So by task versioning, what we mean is that again, when an, when an ex application executes, you could have a, a task version for it potentially to run to that is written in, a, in Java or written in, 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 in Python or, or, or CUDA and a task version again, that could be run on a CPU, potentially on a GPU and potentially on, on an FPGA. Okay, so the fine grain tasks themselves are implemented for different target devices. So here, as you could see, we have a, a, just an example of how this coarse grain task and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, fine grain task work. So you take a basic uh, matrix multiplication. Uh, if you look at the main code on top, le top left, you can have an interface for, for this that says uh, this, this uh, matrix multiplication can run on a CPU, can run on a GPU. Then you can implement the coarse grain uh, 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 task, for example, using what we call this, uh, this pragma, one uh, for, the, for the CPU and one for the GPU. Within your coarse grain task implementation, you will have to think about the fine grain task implementation that says this is potentially uh, uh, runs on a device, it could be a CUDA, it could be an FPGA, it could be a CPU, it could be whatever you like. So again, this task annotation, uh, so the, sorry, this, this, uh, this code annotation using uh, constraints and pragmas and uh, can ag are actually part of the programming model itself. And you will have to obviously know how to, how to, uh, how to, how to use these. So as mentioned earlier, there is support to use several languages uh, at the coarse grain, as well as the fine grain level. You could have an, an, an implement, uh, uh, um, uh, a, a, task, a task for, uh, for in, in Python or in Java. And there is also uh, the, the, uh, the support for, uh, for, for the legacy software, uh, for example, binary code, as well as MPI application, something that again, the high performance computing community uh, does appreciate a lot. So again, uh, a quick, uh, a quick uh, uh, recap about COMS and OMS. Uh, COMS very much platform level, coarse grain tasks, uh, and, and OMS the intra level that manages the intra node uh, heterogeneity. Okay. So in this case here, the one important aspect of these tasks uh, of this application is to end up with what we call a, a direct acyc acyclic graph. So with direct acyclic graph, you will expect that the, the, the task dependent dependencies are there and there is and that the, the nodes are tasks, the nodes are assigned tasks to actually execute and, and, and the data dependencies between the tasks are also, are also highlighted by, at, at, at this stage. So one thing that is uh, certainly important here is to, is, is to, uh, is to realize that uh, the key feature of the programming model comes into its product productivity. It makes somehow again, the task of the, of the software developer much easier when it comes to running an application on an heterogeneous uh, system. It's the same programming model for distributed heterogeneous environment. And again, the runtime itself has the power because it has the parallel execution complexity and the execution of the, uh, of the task because it detects the, the parallelism inherent in the, uh, in, in the application and, and, and transparently uh, execute the actual tasks. So one aspect of the of this is again is what did we do which was not there in in the uh, in in this as part of this research. So we focused on the self adaptation support here, and and we had to rework on the to uh, to extend the runtime in order to be able to have the task version selection according to the available resource configuration. So you are expected the the, uh, the runtime to be able to 
to, to, to monitor all the data, to monitor the infrastructure, to be able again to estimate, for example, the, exec the, execu the, the execution time of an application on a specific device. So, and based on this task parallelism and the monitor data, you could uh, expect the runtime to auto scale the resources according to the required quality of the execution. So, in a nutshell, the way you actually worked in, the, uh, in, the, in, in this research was that once we annotate all the methods with the input, the output, and the input output data, you have the concept of task versioning that say this task is sequential, this task is multi threaded, this task is for OpenCL, CUDA, binaries, MPI, etc. And then you will build the, the, the task dependencies and we end up with the direct acyclic graph. And thanks to that, the runtime is able again to, pro, to, to use the profiling information in order to really have a clear idea of, uh, of, of, uh, of the task duration, the task execution, the, 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 the energy it is likely to, to, to consume in its environment. And then attached to this are uh, the heterogeneous resources availability, because again, you could, uh, you could expect this application to run an environment where heterogeneous resources are there or sometimes not there because the, 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 uh, the, the environment is by, by definition dynamic. So uh, because thanks to the heterogeneous resources availability and the profiling information, the runtime is able to achieve the parallelism it, it, it actually expects. So as part of the self-adaptation, we, we identify two different uh, actuators. The first one is when you have less resources than pending tasks. In this case, you execute the pending task on the resource once it is available. This, the, actually, the, the, the application itself is then accelerated, but again, the power and energy consume, consumption may increase. The other thing, the other uh, actuator is that if you have more resources than pending tasks, in this case, the task could be rescheduled to use minimum number of resources. Okay. So you could reduce the power and energy consumption, but you may increase the execution time. Okay. So it is possible again through any configuration file that you can have a number of constraints that says, potentially this is the maximum number of energy I would like to use. And you let the runtime decide how to, uh, how to, uh, how to run, uh, how to configure your application, how to run your application on this on this uh, in, on this environment. So when you if you are, when you are able to do that, uh, the the work the, the 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 workflow looks like this. You you write your source code from your programming model. You have the, uh, in the Tango architecture, as explained earlier, what we call a, a deployment engine. What we call it the Aldi. It's the application deployment engine. You could, in an HPC environment, create a, sing a, singular a singularity, uh, for example, container, and then you upload the container into the device supervisor. The device supervisor is, works very much like your scheduler. It could be Slurm in an HPC environment. It could be anything else. And then, as part of your execution configuration, you could say, well, I have a number of CPUs, or I have a number of GPUs, or by the way, the runtime should be free to have a, to have a to to combine a CPU and a GPU. Okay, so that's again that's part of the uh, of the application uh, of the execution configuration itself. So if we if we move into the some basic uh, uh, detail on on, on some uh, experiments we did uh, on on to to evaluate the programming model and the self adaptation um, component. Uh, uh, I have to say that this also, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, heterogeneous environment comes from Bull, that's Atos, uh, as mentioned uh, earlier in the previous, uh, in the previous talk. This is, uh, these are a number of nodes available for the project in, uh, at, uh, at Bull uh, premises uh, in, in France. And, and as you could see, a uh, nice mix of uh, Intel Xeons, uh, Sandy Bridge, uh, a number of nodes with the NVDA, uh, Kepler, and then other uh, nodes with the Xeon Phi uh, uh, devices. Uh, in addition to this, you have a, a number of, uh, of, of, of compute uh, blades that were actually uh, Intel Xeon. So uh, bear in mind here that this is 2021, and when, when the, the project started in 2016, and, uh, and, and uh, again, the the uh, um, this, uh, this this hardware may 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 feel a little bit old these days, but here we are, here we are. So, the application that we were that we have considered specifically for the uh, for for this experiment was Gromax, 
which is a molecular dynamic simulation package, extremely uh, well known and certainly a nice reference uh, in the world of, of HPC. And in addition to, uh, to, to this, we had to build, uh, uh, we, we had to implement on top of Gromax another tool called the uh, PyMD setup, uh, which is very much written in Python. It facilitates the, the setup and the execution of the systems for, for molecular dynamic simulation. Example, the number of protein mutations that you would have to do, that you have to consider during your simulation. I've got, I've got some examples, uh, I've got some examples here. So uh, here we have, we had to look at various configuration of the application, whether you want to use two protein mutation, more over here, four mutations, six mutations, eight mutations, and 10 mutations. So what does it mean here? So it simply means here that the, the programming model in the two protein mutation had the choice of using CPUs, GPUs together, or, or simply run the application on, 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 on simply on, on, on best CPUs. And, and you realize that the execution uh, version in the first case was uh, uh, in, invoked uh, uh, in, in sorry, invoked uh, uh, eight CPUs and one GPU, whereas in the second one, it, it, uh, it, had to, it had to use only 24 GPUs. So it looks again, because of the executed versions that were available for the run, for the runtime, uh, it is actually certainly better for the runtime to, uh, to, to use a mix of CPU, GPUs, uh, and, and have an execution time of 150 uh, seconds and energy consumed of 53 uh, kilojoules. Okay? So the task version itself automatically uh, 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 was selected by, by the actual runtime and, and, the, and the adaptation itself didn't require any code at all. So that's again something that is, can be done it, uh, uh, automatically by the, by the actual runtime. Obviously, because Gromax is, is parameterizable, you could look at four mutations, six mutations, eight mutations, 10 mutations, etc. So if you look at four mutations, the runtime did not do anything at all. It just assumed that again, you could have uh, uh, to use all the CPUs that were available. When it came to eight uh, 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 mutations and six mutations and 10 mutations, the runtime has to adapt automatically without, again, without, without, the, the, without the, the, the actual uh, user intervention. So if you, uh, if you look at, again, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the task dependency uh, graph that are generated, uh, they're all different when, we, when you compare them to from four to eight and, and, and to 10. And then you look at the parallel work is estimated by the, by the actual runtime and the resources that are used uh, uh, for its execution. So somehow again, the, the, uh, the, 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 the runtime automatically, according to the, to the, uh, according to the environment, would, would decide to increase or decrease the number of resources. So here for eight, uh, for, 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 uh, for eight uh, mutations, you can e easily see that again, the runtime has to scale uh, uh, down to two resources to speed up the actual execution. Okay, so because of the parallel workload uh, during that execution, the, expe the expect expected time to execute the dependency uh, task in every uh, evaluation interval again is 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 uh, is managed by the, by the by the runtime, and again you, the, uh, the 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 runtime itself had decided as part of the actuator to scale down the number of the, the, to scale up to, to to three resources, the uh, the actual. Uh, the, the, the actual uh, the, 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 during, during the, the, the self adaptation. One of the other important things here, if you look at a larger number of mutations in the application, that's 20 mutations, you can, thanks to the configuration file, say, I would like to impose a constraint on my time, my execution time, or I can impose some constraint on my energy. Okay? So uh, in, the, in this table, you could see that uh, you can start two resources. And let the runtime again to scale up or to scale down. So if there are no constraints on on uh, and on, on on time and, and energy, expect again that you 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 the runtime will use up to five nodes, and 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 get an execution time of 457 seconds. Or as part of the, uh, of, of part of the optimization of the energy, you can just use two nodes, but expect an, a time uh, of 1029 seconds versus again, 670 kilojoules. You can, as part of the configuration file, impose a constraint. And in this case, 
as part of the uh, uh, as part of the optimization of the time we put a maximum energy of 700 kilojoule the runtime automatically automatically ended up executing the application in 559 seconds right fulfilling the actual constraint of 700 kilojoule that's 693 kilojoule but used four nodes whereas in the second other example if we want to optimize the energy we set a deadline of 800 seconds. Again, it was possible to run the application in 751 seconds and consume 679 kilojoule. But again, with the, with the, actually a smaller number of, of nodes. Right. So that's somehow my my uh, my conclusion. This is to do again with uh, trying to to enhance uh, programming models for distributed heterogeneous computing. Uh, trying to get uh, an, an, uh, an, an application, hopefully uh, self-adapt according to the resources that are available uh, to it in the environment. We specifically use uh, the, the COMS and OMS programming models. Uh, the, the, the importance of this uh, task-based models for the whole application helps not only capture the parallelism inherent in the model, but, but also uh, be able to, to integrate uh, uh, legacy kernels, MPIs, CUDA, OpenCL as part of the task versioning. So this programming model is use, usable in different environments. So there is a clear support for self-adaptation and self-adaptation is important for quality of service, especially in, when applications run in low power and low energy environments. So the application execution it is automatically adapted to the available resources and the, 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 we, we see how the scheduling actually worked in terms of efficient implementation per task according to the desired quality, either performance or, or energy. Okay. And we also see how the, uh, the, the elastic resource uh, is, is actually used. So we, this, uh, we have more research, of course, need to do in the, in the context of this, uh, of, of this, uh, this uh, project and, and, and in, the, in follow up. For example, to look at networking improved distributed platforms, especially looking at real uh, task latency and real time application in embedded systems. You could look at, I'm aware of uh, ongoing work on the world of FPGAs, especially in multiple kernels in FPGAs and multi FPGA environments at Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and potentially enhance uh, or extend the number of use cases in terms, for example, of edge IoT uh, computing. Thank you for this. Uh, we have a number of uh, publications in this in this aspect uh, if, if you would like to uh, to have a look at the um, uh, papers uh, published on the uh, on the uh, on, on this topic please uh, please listen to me and I'm happy to to share these publications with you thank you thank you Karim um, thank you for your uh, interesting presentation uh, I don't know if there are uh, some questions from uh, the, the audience. Uh, I don't see uh, questions for you. I'm just curious, uh, maybe I can just ask you one, yeah. one, uh, one thing. Uh, um, how much time does it take the, um, the, 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 your system to to take uh, adaptation. Uh, um. Okay, so so again, so you that okay that that that's an interesting question. So the uh, the self adaptation itself doesn't take doesn't take a, a more time. It is it, somehow incorporated in the runtime itself. So whether you run the run the 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 the, the comps or OMS runtime with or without the self adaptation. You will not see much difference at all. The, the, the reason is that the self adaptation is, is an extension of the runtime. Expect again a little bit of overhead because of the data collection, the data profiling, etc. But according to our to our uh, benchmark, well, to our experiments, especially looking at the benchmarks, it wasn't. It was almost again. It, it, we will not. It's not something that you will notice anyway. So it will not again. The overhead is pretty pretty small. That's fine. So again, bear in mind that this uh, this research builds on on on, on existing uh, research at Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and the and the uh, this one here, the Star S, uh, OMS and COMS, 
have been have been a, have been certainly uh, I would say a rather long time now, but also have been maintained by uh, by, uh, by by BSC over too many years. So the, the the performance of the runtime itself is is certainly something that is that we can rely on. So uh, I have another uh, just a small question because uh, yeah. we we have time uh, before the uh, the first break. Uh, um, as far as uh, I know, uh, AI machine learning uh, application uh, have uh, quite different, um, let's say, requirements uh, if you compare to, to other kind of application like uh, you have in HPC. Um, did you already uh, analyze that? How your, um, your, your, uh, your system uh, performed with some, this kind of application? Because I, I think that uh, uh, in uh, AI machine learning uh, environment and application, you have uh, mm, twice the problem because one, uh, uh, in one case, you have uh, just inference and you, have, uh, uh, you need to, uh, to be as fast as possible. Of yeah. course, uh, if, you have to, mm, if you go for the training, uh, you have uh, much more problem because uh, you have to, um, to pass lot of time to, uh, on the system so yes that's uh, uh, alberto that that's a very good that's a very good question so uh, i have to say that uh, it, it will be certainly we, we have not done it we have not co considered any applications for example from ai machine learning deep learning the main application that we have used uh, that we have tested as part of the of, of this uh, of this research was first uh, in high performance computing uh, the second one was an embedded system, and the third one was a basic IoT application, mm -hmm. which was very much about uh, streaming video over over the network, uh, having sense uh, in addition to some sensors, data, etc. And 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 the all the experiments we've done were in the context of CPUs, GPUs, and FPGA. You have a point here: is that uh, the application, an application such as machine learning or or deep learning can bring its own uh, potentially challenges uh, in the sense that um, we, we know that this, what is required is not only the, the computing power, but what, sorry, the computing power, but also it is, it is possible that you could actually put it in a low power, uh, low energy environment. If you, if you take a, uh, I don't know, a driverless car or, or, or whatever. So I will, I will say that it would be certainly a very interesting, uh, uh, I would say use case to have uh, and uh, my, um, I would say that from my own uh, knowledge, right, there is, uh, there's been more work over the last 12 months, especially in the context of, of, of FPGAs and, and, uh, and multi FPGAs, because uh, even, even again, even FPGAs themselves can be a candidate for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, for, for machine learning. Okay, yeah. we, we, we all know that. So, Again, very good question. Uh, I have I, I, because we have I have we have not done it. it would be certainly uh, it would be certainly interesting to look at uh, how this uh, self adaptation can actually work. Yeah, it's a good question. I think also because um, the the market and the research community is very active, also providing uh, uh, every year some new new piece of hardware. Just dedicated to, to them, so yes, yeah. to, to try to, to cover the uh, the full stack uh, uh, could be maybe a, a next step. <laughs> exactly, no, 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 exactly, exactly. So you you're right in the sense that you if you look at the hardware that is used in this context here, right? Uh, again, the, 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 it, it could be anything these days, anything that could be uh, that, that could be again. Uh, uh, tensor, the, the TensorFlow, or, 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 or anything in relation to machine learning, deep learning, etc. Definitely, FPGAs and also multi multi FPGAs have now. There's been quite a substantial also interest in in the use, uh, especially with the multi FPGAs with boards that are that made up of say of up to eight or even sixteen uh, FPGAs. That's one way to accelerate the, uh, the applications. And they're quite, again, there's certainly some interest in research community trying to get the, uh, trying to get again, the, uh, the uh, machine learning AI, AI, AI based application running on, on these. But again, certainly a good, a good initiative. Yeah.
maybe for the next year uh next workshop uh <laughs> who knows yes again and uh maybe you could uh could show uh, uh next uh, new steps uh, who knows yes no no yes that who knows yes we are we are certainly for the next workshop i can certainly promise some results on the on this work here we are doing on the uh on, on edge computing, right? So, so that's again, that's, that, that's an application that, running, that is running in a distributed way, distributed way. So running on, on, you have the IoT device, you have the edge device, you have the cloud device, everything, uh, or cloud resource, everything is distributed. But at the same time, if you would like to um, keep an eye on, the, on your energy, uh, especially in in uh, on on at the at, at the layer at the layer of the edge devices that's again that's, that's an interesting uh, that's in itself an interesting uh, an interesting problem okay so we are we are doing we are involved in a project where we are uh, looking at uh, at resource rela resource availability resource reliability energy consumption in this context of an edge iot computing environment so maybe for next year <laughs> okay thanks again uh, karim for uh, thank the you Again, and, for uh, inviting. I think that um, we are a uh, um, few minutes uh, in advance for the next break. Um, so uh, I invite all the attendees uh, uh, and panelists to, um, to connect uh, at uh, 11.30, uh, so after uh, the coffee break. So enjoy the coffee break. Uh, even if uh, it's uh, uh, at your home, uh, your home, uh, whatever. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you. Thanks. We have insight uh, will be presented by Alberto in the next presentation. What uh, each platform needs some requirements and uh, our requirements uh, for our platform are provided by three pilots. One is about this aeronautics domain. We Here we are working mainly with uh, CFD simulation, rotating parts 3D visualization. Then we have uh, requirements from earthquake and tsunami pilot. Here the, we are working with prediction models, geographic and urban databases, emergency emergency organizations and the big topic is in general urban computing and urban computing is uh, urgent computing pardon and urgent computing is also relevant for the third pilot which is about weather and climate here we are working with uh, wolf model which are producing the big amounts of data then we have a set of uh, various post processing uh, cases and applications for floods wildfires and uh, agriculture and now I will show you shortly the examples from our what we are doing inside the pilots in more details. In the weather and climate large scale pilot, we are going from the very large simulations on the from the global weather model. We are taking this data, going with them to the regional level and then to the application level. So we have here workflow, which needs HPC, but also cloud uh, computing is uh, necessary or is enough for some cases on the applications level. From the data point of view, we have to work here with uh, big data movement and uh, our distributed data management solution has to support two different uh, approaches. One is uh, very specific for the curated weather and climate data. We have special uh, library for this. And then we have a general way for, for distributed data management that we have for this uh, our infrastructure. From the workflow level here on the right side, you can see that our workflow has a cloud part which has uh, virtual machines with different application and the HPC part mainly for WARF model. And between, we have a special task which are responsible for data movement, uh, for executing, and our orchestration orchestrator is aware about this. So you can see here that combination uh, in our workflow, we have uh, the combination of the cloud cases, plus HPC and data transfer between them. 
In the earthquake and tsunami large-scale pilot, uh, we are here aware about uh, event-driven automatized ex workflow execution. So our workflow here are executed not by human, by but uh, by special application, which is checking if some event is happened. And if yes, it has to be the, the execution of the workflow has to be automatically run it, provided. So the event driven uh, here is uh, very important and also the near real time analysis are really very important because we have to provide the results to the customers as soon as possible after the event was identified. So you can see that in the workflow we have uh, open street maps and open bin the map for the uh, taking the information about place when the event happened. Then we have here event trigger, which is going to special applications. In the end, after the models are computed, the area of interest are moved, moved to our uh, company Itaka, which is responsible with uh, their desktop application for the checking the situation and uh, working with, uh, with uh, disaster management teams. So this is a high level workflow. And here I have small, but we have tried to show you how this workflow is transferred to our Orient for cloud. So you can see that uh, for earthquake and tsunami, we have three steps and each steps can be represented by separated workflow. One workflow is uh, for event trigger. This workflow is then responsible for executing uh, the green one. And uh, if more events happened, we can execute multiple green one workflows. Inside these workflows, we are taking the data, moving to the model, and then provides the results, which are visualized to our user. But I would like to highlight this the one important part, and it is about the execution of Sunavi model on the multiple locations. Because we know that sometimes uh, it, or it, is, uh, it is normal that uh, we cannot execute very light simulation uh, on the HPC cluster uh, uh, if you don't if you don't have a special queue you have to wait it is not easy to execute it uh, in the real time but what we would like to minimize the problem with waiting time in the queues so we are executing several Soon Avi jobs on different locations, on different centers, and also on the cloud. And then, if the first result is uh, done, we are taking it and moving to the next computation. So, selection, dynamic selection of the multiple location is uh, one important requirement, and execution on the multiple locations, and then data sharing between the center centers. The last pilot uh, is a uh, more classical uh, HPC pilot with uh, CFD simulation. In this pilot, uh, we would like to uh, help our company with a shortened time of the, of the computation. So in the projects, we are working with, uh, with uh, the draft code and we are transferring the CPU code to GPU codes for our partners. And also we prepared the workflow for the AVIO IRO for easy execution of the computation by AVIO engineers. In this workflow, on the cloud part, you can see here cloud, the cloud part, the engineer in the first step can uh, set up uh, the, the parameters. Here I show, I'm showing you the example with open source, uh, open form solver. First step is setting the parameters. So we have to uh, run uh, the virtual machine with appropriate software. Then a user is interacting with uh, this uh, virtual machine. Then we are copy copying data and uh, execute. And next step is execution of the open form solver on the HPC part. And then we are moving to the part of the workflow, which is about 3D visualization. So our orchestrator automatically copy data, creates a virtual machine with, uh, with appropriate software stack and inform the user that the, the computation is done and user can start the interaction with uh, the results. At the end, it is possible to download the data for the next manipulation on the desktops and so on. 
So it was about the requirements uh, from the pilot and uh, one important requirement for us is uh, easy access to, to the HPC cluster. So uh, Lexis as a whole is providing uh, the set to, to type of the service, it's the Lexis platform, then the services with uh, deploying the software stacks on the HPC cluster. So for this, we, we need uh, more specialists, but at the end, in the web portal, the Avioario, as an example, has uh, everything for upload the data, execute the workflow, and uh, download the data and uh, visualize it. So, uh, IT for uh, so Avioario engineers, for example, can work at the end only with web portal, and they, they don't need to know anything about the HPC, which is at the backend. Together with uh, info about available resources and to use it core out. So in user in the special role, for example, a manager can uh, will see what uh, is what was used and if he need more resources, uh, he need to pay more resources or allocate more resources or not. This was about our platform and uh, in the next month we have we would like to validate our platform behind the Lexis open call. This open call is very important for us because we would like to take more examples by them to validate uh, or the whole process uh, which uh, we have inside the project and provide this feedback to the technical work packages in the Lexis and by this update the platform to have at the end of the projects as much as possible platform ready to the market. Open call will, be, our access to our platform will be provided for free. In the open call, we are, we will also provide to the open call applicants the core hours on our centers for testing of platform and the service which will help them to deploy the codes on the HPC environment to we will provide to them the training how to use our platform and so on. To be part of the open call, it is very easy. You need to go to our website, register then, then on, the, on the website, then to check the rules, uh, what uh, check what we can provide and so on, and then prepare the short word document. We already prepared the template for uh, administration of the of the open call so you have to fill our administrative self-administrated questionnaire and then on the main on the monthly basis we will evaluate this uh, these applications and uh, then if they will be successful we will cooperate with them so as a conclusion i would like to say that uh, lexis uh, we all will be European Cloud HPC workflow platform for the special cases with industry SMEs, but we hope also with, uh, with uh, research institutions, which uh, has inside distributed data infrastructure. We are providing easy usability via portal, or in some cases you can use uh, uh, REST APIs. So we are talking here about the uh, machine machine to machine interaction because in one of our cases we are also working with uh, Tezeo smart gateway which is automatically connected with the Lexis platform data federation is important for us currently we have uh, two center inside IT4 and LRZ but uh, further participant will come and uh, currently we are in the negotiation with two or three and other centers to be part of the Lexis uh, platform I already mentioned EU dot uh, and uh, open call, and we hope that uh, by the more cases we can evaluate the platform and have it ready. So, future steps for the 2021 is benchmarking, optimiz op optimization of the platform, integrating the feedback from the open call, and to what we would like to also prepare, and we will prepare the lesson learned from the last, uh, from the Lexis project's uh, duration to help by this lesson learned community, uh, which would like to combine HPC cloud and big data together. So thank you for your attention. And Alberto, I think that you will tell more details and about the technical part, and I'm open for question now.
Thank you, Jan, again for the, um, your uh, introduction of the Lexix uh, uh, project. Um, uh, I will uh, take the um, uh, question and answer uh, uh, session for uh, later on, just to uh, cover uh, the, um, at least uh, the technical part. Okay. I will share my screen again. Okay. Hope, hope that you can uh, see again my, my screen. Uh, well, uh, welcome back, uh, everybody. Um, as I said before, I'm Berto Shonti from Nix Foundation, and as Lynx uh, Foundation, we are um, partner of the uh, of the Lexis project. And uh, I will show in this talk uh, um, the Lexis approach to the workflow uh, data um, uh, and data management with a focus on technological aspects. Uh, um, so more specifically, I will provide uh, some motivations and driving factors uh, that support uh, the envision at the Lexis, um, Lexis platform. According, uh, and according to them, I will present uh, the main architectural view of the Lexis platform. Um, then I will, uh, uh, I, I will uh, go uh, more for, in a more uh, focused fashion and analysis of the four main elements uh, that compose the Lexis architecture uh, that are in the order um, the orchestration service, uh, the distributed data infrastructure service, the security and uh, authorization authentication service uh, or AI. And finally, uh, I will give you um, uh, uh, some, some information, more technical information regarding the Lexis port. Okay, uh, the Lex platform and the, its co-design uh, are motivated and driven by uh, basically the emerge of modern application uh, workflows that are uh, increasingly becoming complex since they combine tasks uh, that requires not only HPC resources, but uh, uh, they are starting requiring also big data processing capabilities and cloud resources. Uh, do such combination of HPC, Big Data, and Cloud requires uh, a fully converged platform for the execution. Uh, a second point is that such workflows are more and more demanding for uh, heterogeneous hardware uh, at the infrastructural level, such as, uh, uh, for example, GPUs or FPGAs, uh, just to mention a few. Uh, mainly in order to boost performance and um, computing performance and uh, I.O. performance also, and still keep uh, energy consumption low. Uh, a third element uh, is, to, um, uh, is the need to, to achieve more flexibility. Uh, and this can be done uh, through virtualization technologies such as uh, um, traditional virtual machines or uh, um, containers uh, that should be integrated in the execution platform. Uh, in the Lexis project, all these factors, uh, uh, as also mentioned in the previous uh, uh, previous presentation, um, are well present in the workflows uh, uh, we have in the three main pilots um, that covers uh, uh, aeronautics, uh, earthquake and tsunami and weather climate uh, application, uh, as already mentioned before. Uh, the analysis uh, of the different application requirements uh, uh, drove the co-design phase of the Lexis uh, uh, platform, which uh, basically handed in, the, in this architecture that you can see here in the slides, uh, which is basically a federation of a geographically distributed pool of uh, computing and storage resources whose management is uh, um, governed by dedicated and data orchestration services. Uh, the result is thus uh, an HPC cloud and big data converged architecture supporting uh, the federation of uh, European computing centers. Uh, results, of course, span from traditional HPC, but uh, they also include uh, uh, cloud computing uh, uh, ones. And of course, uh, security as has been considered in the co-design since the, the, the beginning as a prime citizen. 
So um, the platform is open and ready to integrate uh, also in the future, of course, uh, uh, the resources and data sources made available by other computing centers, uh, as well as data providers that will uh, uh, often join the, the Lexis platform. Mm, as I said before, to better support the convergence of HPC cloud and big data, uh, big data application workflows, uh, advanced technological elements have been uh, uh, integrated in the platform at the infrastructural level. Uh, here we uh, we just uh, uh, show you the, the the main the main ones. Uh, uh, they, they comprise basically bus buffers uh, with NVMe. NVMe uh, data nodes, uh, which are uh, uh, used to provide a boost in IO, IO operations uh, uh, and better performance for parallel file system caching. GPUs uh, acceleration for uh, dramatically boosting uh, the execution of easily computational tasks, but also uh, to provide 3D remote visualization support. Mm, well, that are uh, uh, basically provided uh, mainly from, through a DGX2 um, uh, machine. Um, finally, uh, we also start to investigate uh, FPGAs, uh, uh, not only for uh, um, uh, online on the fly file processing, but also in, in some case for uh, code acceleration, as for example in the uh, case of the uh, earthquake and tsunami uh, pilot. Um, on top of this heterogeneous set of infrastructural resources, uh, we, uh, we set up a, a set of services uh, that, has been, uh, that have been designed uh, and integrated in the platform. Uh, as such, the architecture has um, basically a portal supported by a front end and a back end. Uh, an orchestration service, data management service, um, here called, uh, here after called uh, um, DDI, that stands for Distributed Data Infrastructure, uh, an authentication authorization service, and finally uh, a module for managing the accounting and billing. Mm, the first service uh, I will analyze in a, a little bit in depth is the orchestration uh, one. Uh, it allows to control the execution of an application workflow over the federated company and storage resources. Uh, the service is actually composed of multiple elements. We have uh, basically a front-end module uh, called uh, Allen for Cloud, uh, which provides API for uh, communicating, communicating with the other platform services. Um, and it also offers uh, a, a way for application developer uh, developers to uh, define their own uh, their own, own uh, application workflow. Um, the second module is uh, called York, uh, and this uh, it is the actual orchestration engine. Uh, it takes the responsibility of executing uh, a given workflow, uh, and uh, it can. Uh, uh, run in multiple instances for uh, to increase the, the resiliency of the of the service. Um, uh, it also communicates directly with uh, the other two modules you can see in the, the schema, which are the dynamic task placement and the EP uh, middleware. Uh, the, the former one is uh, responsible for uh, dynamically um, that means uh, on the fly during the execution of the workflow, allocating tasks on the most suitable resources, um, taking account the status of the, the infrastructures uh, and where data resides or need to be moved, uh, moved to. Uh, the EP middleware um, is used uh, uh, basically to access, to, to provide the access uh, uh, to the HPC resources, uh, thus allowing the, the execution of, uh, of jobs. Um, just to uh, completeness, um, Allen for Cloud and York are uh, modules provided by uh, our partners Ethos, uh, while uh, EP Middleware is a piece of software developed by IT for Innovations, a supercomputing set. Uh, as previously stated, uh, um, Allen for Cloud uh, 
represent the, the orchestrator front end, uh, it uh, exposes a REST API, but also a user interface, uh, as you can see in the picture on the, on the right, mainly used by the application designer to create new application work, uh, workflow templates. Um, to that, the designer uh, basically gets access to a catalog of uh, components, which represents both infrastructural elements or piece of software um, needed to um, uh, needed to, um, to 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 require to 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 run the task. For example, the instantiation of a container. Mm -hmm. Then. Uh, other ad hoc components can be, uh, can be added uh, to the catalog for uh, specific purposes, uh, of course. Uh, the entire orchestration flow uses, uh, uh, the, is based on the Tosca standard to describe the, uh, which is used to describe basically all the components, uh, um, their composition into an application template, the requirements and um, uh, basically all the associated uh, uh, workflows. Uh, Tosca basically abstracts an application uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a graph where nodes uh, uh, are components and the edges uh, uh, represent uh, relationships among them. Um, workflows can be automatically discovered by the orchestrator um, for uh, basically for standard operations uh, such as installing the application starting and stopping uh, the application or uh, even deleting uh, the application. For other uh, cases, in, in, it is uh, still possible to define and add uh, manually uh, workflows. Uh, once the application uh, workflow template has been defined, it can be, uh, of course, instantiated and executed. Um, at this stage, uh, all the components uh, can also can be configured. Um, uh, and during the, the execution, the orchestration engine executes uh, each task composing the, the workflow, uh, taking into account the policies uh, set uh, and leveraging on the DDI service for uh, uh, moving uh, data um, uh, required by the, the task. Um, it also interacts uh, with the dynamic task placement service um, in order to get uh, on the fly uh, the, the best set of resources where to run. Um, again, for completeness, uh, this, uh, this feature is uh, still uh, under, uh, under development, uh, but basically the, the, the behavior of the, of the system uh, is uh, as I um, described now. Uh, the access to the HPC resources mediated, uh, as said before, by AP Middleware. Uh, this is a software component uh, um, designed by uh, for innovations, uh, which uses uh, uh, common templates to define uh, basically what will be executed in the cluster, uh, HPC cluster, in terms of uh, arbitrary script, uh, binary dependency, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, it, it also provides a uh, capability to define variables uh, for input parameters. And uh, the users, uh, of course, can actually um, uh, set the, the substitute, the, the values, uh, actual values to, to those variables uh, when the um, command template is running. Uh, integration of the, uh, of the middleware, EP middleware, middleware with the other orchestration components uh, uh, has been done by extending basically Alien for Cloud and uh, your components. In such a way, uh, we have uh, uh, introduced in the um, catalog I showed you before, uh, a components representing a, a HPC job. Um, this component is also accompanied by an extended uh, interface uh, which allow to uh, basically to control the submission of the job, um, check uh, uh, when uh, uh, the, the job completes, and uh, eventually cancel them. Um, obviously, through this uh, task extension, uh, the users has also the um, capability basically to, um, uh, to run jobs uh, on uh, both HPC side and cloud uh, resources. Uh, 
more in, uh, in depth, the dynamic uh, task placement relies on the delegation function that is a, a feature available um, in Tosca for when you define um, the workflows. Um, basically, every time a task implies to the, the selection of a certain resource uh, for, uh, for running, uh, for example, the instantiation of a virtual machine or running a job on a HPC cluster, uh, the orchestrator can delegate the selection of the actual resource uh, to an external function. Um, to this end, we, uh, we started developing uh, such function. Um, so through an API, uh, the, basically the York engine can ask to return the best HPC or cloud location. Mm, uh, with, mm, and this selection process basically is uh, based on a greedy strategy which combine, which try to combine uh, monitoring information uh, provided by uh, the, the monitoring services of, uh, of the various infrastructure uh, being part of the, of the platform. Uh, it can also take into account uh, uh, an availability periods for the resources. And we also um, track uh, of the decision made for uh, uh, subsequent uh, uh, exploitation of, the, of this information to improve the mm, selection mechanism uh, itself. But data management service in Lexis is based on a layered approach. Mm, integration at the federation level is provided by uh, data management solution, which are based on uh, IROTS and the UDAT uh, framework, um, which allow um, a simple and quite transparent management of the data set uh, across uh, the, um, the company center. Um, in other words, we have uh, multiple sites uh, and we provide one uh, file system view. Locally to each center, data management uh, uh, is based on cloud file storage, along file access mechanism, uh, parallel file system, and uh, um, technological uh, part such as uh, bus buffers. Um, to properly work uh, the system we had we had set, uh, um, we need to uh, need to uh, make working uh, a working installation of uh, IROTS. Um, IROTS do is uh, replicated in each computing center and uh, then federated uh, uh, as a federated IROTS zones. Mm. IROTS uses also an internal catalog of file system and metadata, which are stored in the uh, specific database called uh, ICAT, uh, which is a uh, mm, local backend with storage uh, and parallel file system solution uh, in each center. Um, IROTS servers provide a unified logical space across distributed um, storage locations. And mm, here data movement is basically triggered uh, and orchestrated through uh, the provided staging uh, uh, API, um, which allows to uh, move data from one center to uh, another one. So from one resources, type of resources to uh, other ones. Uh, through this uh, data management layer, the Lexis platform provides uh, the, the following uh, capabilities, uh, uh, searching for specific uh, metadata, in other words, that search, accessing to specific data, uh, data harmonization, or uh, staging of the data. Um, since data management is uh, a critical uh, element from the security viewpoint, uh, the DDI service uh, also reflects uh, the security policies set in the uh, AI service uh, um, in order to, sorry, uh, in order to um, to, to, to keep security uh, uh, to keep security uh, aspect uh, high. Uh, security has been uh, considered, uh, uh, as I said before, uh, of primary importance since the beginning of the uh, Lexis uh, platform co-design. Thus, uh, a security layer has been introduced uh, by uh, means of uh, the Federated Authentication Authorization Service uh, the AI service uh, in a uh, um, few words. Um, this uh, uh, introduction of this service led to the following uh, um, 
as you can see here, uh, three layer architecture. Uh, we have basically the portal front end uh, lying the DMZ uh, area, uh, while other critical services uh, um, are layered in the, what we call uh, Lexis Trusted Zone. Um, finally, each company in center, uh, being part of the federation, provide uh, um, additional security features by their own, their own um, at the HPC and cloud infrastructure level. Security is uh, uh, assured by means of uh, modern frameworks and tools. Uh, we uh, mainly uh, consider Keyclock, OpenID, uh, SAML, uh, Open Authorization version 2, but also the um, EP middleware um, mentioned before is part of uh, um, the, the security, uh, the security uh, pack. Mm, the basic mechanism for authorizing operations in uh, Lexis and the Lexis platform is based on uh, token, uh, which are released uh, by the key clock uh, installation. So before executing any operation, uh, involved services verify the validity of the, of the token. Uh, user author authorization uh, is also uh, based uh, and their privileges uh, on the platform are based on the Airbuck model, uh, which is reflected in the also uh, data, distributed data uh, infrastructure uh, folder uh, scheme. Um, the for uh, uh, our airbag model we basically uh, defined the uh, five main roles uh, which are of course configured and reflected inside the key clock uh, system um, to ensure the resiliency uh, of the of the system um, uh, for this uh, uh, critical uh, critical service um, we um, go. We, we went for uh, an installation that uh, provides uh, high availability, um, as you can see here. So here the the, um, the requirements are to, um, to to create an installation that tries to balance the traffic towards the key clock servers and try to uh, and maintains uh, internal databases uh, synchronized. Mm, Lexis users uh, get access to certain amount of uh, certain amount of uh, company resources across the federation uh, uh, of company center, uh, basically uh, by um, an, through an approval system, dedicated approval system uh, that uh, uh, allows to uh, grant them the, the the access to to those resources. Basically, the approval process allows to uh, map um, somehow the authorized Lexis uh, company projects uh, with the internal supercomputing center projects, uh, which uh, represent uh, basically the uh, available uh, resources uh, uh, provided that by the, that center. Um, so basically, the, the, the Lexis user must be authorized by project investigators uh, in each supercomputing center uh, that provides uh, such resources in order to get uh, access uh, to, to, the, um, to those resources. Um, there is no direct and explicit connection between uh, Lexis and uh, HPC, center, uh, HPC center accounts. Uh, this to uh, keep uh, um, uh, as high uh, as possible the, the security. Uh, so uh, we relied basically on the EP middleware capabilities to um, provide such a, uh, such a mapping. Mm, the last architectural components uh, of the Lexis uh, uh, platform is the represented the last but not least, uh, of course, uh, is represented by the portal. Uh, we developed the portal around uh, seven main components. Basically, the, um, we have a um, front end that is a rich React based uh, uh, application that uh, interacts with the uh, portal front end server and primarily the uh, Lexis portal API. Uh, the portal front end server is a simple process uh, serving the front end application and providing uh, uh, basically the, the content and obtaining a valid token from key clock uh, module. 
uh, the Lexis portal API represents the main entry point by which uh, the front-end uh, application can uh, access uh, the functionalities offered by the, uh, the portal itself. Um, and of course, to, to get access to the API, uh, it is required a valid token. Um, the Lexis user org service contains the, the set of users, organizations, and projects defined within the Lexis system. Uh, to this end, uh, permanent storage is uh, also used to, uh, as a local database. Uh, there is a Allen for Cloud interface uh, um, to support interaction with the Allen for Cloud uh, and similar for interacting with the DDI uh, services. Uh, finally, there is a um, dedicated component, uh, the Cyclops uh, components, which provide uh, capabilities for managing the accounting and billing operations. Uh, this uh, last component uh, is uh, by itself um, a rich uh, system uh, with several components. Uh, basically, it receives periodically uh, from uh, um, uh, the, the EP collectors, that is the uh, information collectors from uh, HPC uh, resources and from uh, um, OpenStack uh, for the cloud counterpart, uh, information uh, related to um, billable uh, entities. Uh, here, there is a Kafka cluster that provides uh, uh, messaging capabilities for uh, um, the, um, all the microservices composing this uh, uh, Cyclops uh, module. Uh, the portal basically uh, API communicates with this, uh, um, this module uh, depending on the specific user privilege to obtain information, resources, consumption, and accounting. And on the other hand, uh, this um, Cyclops Cyclop system provides an API for uh, exposing usage records and charge records, uh, which uh, can be uh, requested by the front-end uh, application uh, for, uh, of course, uh, uh, later uh, displaying purposes. So to summarize, uh, the Lexis platform has been co-designed around the requirements uh, and needs of modern application workflows, um, which are uh, more tailored for converged uh, HPC cloud and big data platforms, uh, as we have uh, in uh, our free pilots. Um, this is achieved through the integration of uh, federated heterogeneous uh, uh, technologies, including FPGA, GPUs, and bus buffers and through the creation of flexible and secure services um, to basically to orchestrate the execution of such new types of application. And finally, on top of these services, uh, uh, we created the uh, Lexis portal, which is structured in such a way to uh, offer uh, a unified view of federated resources and data uh, across all the uh, federated infrastructures. So thank you for attention. Uh, I'm sorry for being a little bit longer uh, than, uh, uh, than planet. Um, I think that we can uh, um, we can stop uh, uh, sharing. Okay. Uh, I think that we can uh, uh, have uh, maybe few. Um, few um, few minutes just to uh, before the the last uh, uh, last uh, presentation of this session for uh, questions. Um, there are questions. Yeah. I see question from uh, Jean Thomas. Um, okay, um, the first one is uh, um, about um, you that. Uh, maybe also Jan can help me on this part because uh, uh, in the project I'm more uh, uh, 
um, more uh, involved in the um, part for uh, uh, orchestration, uh, workflow orchestration. Um, so uh, maybe uh, Jan could uh, uh, could try to also help me answering uh, um, to provide a little bit more information about the uh, UDAT, uh, uh, UDAT uh, framework. Yeah, UDAT is a collaborative uh, data infrastructure in, uh, and what we are using from uh, this uh, infrastructure is uh, the software software stack adopt uh, which was uh, which is uh, irot so you that uh, currently is using also irot it is open source software for data management and uh, same we have uh, in the lexis so we are using uh, this uh, this irot uh, solution together with uh, some uh, Key, not keys, but the identifier from the EUDAT because EUDAT is providing the set of the open services for the for the scientific scientists to register the locations and so on. Yeah, so it is not it is not orchestration orchestrator. Yeah, for the orchestrator we are using a solution from Atos and Alberto already described it. Yeah, this is uh, just uh, to add a uh, very few words. Um, basically, IROTS and you that uh, uh, are uh, um, provides a kind of frameworks for uh, managing the data, data movement, data, uh, all the, the all the aspects related to uh, data management. Uh, so um, it relies on uh, the same level of uh, uh, the orchestrator, which is uh, Mm, of course, uh, intended for uh, uh, managing the, the operation. Uh, so how the, the workflows can be defined, um, can be uh, executed uh, uh, on the available uh, infrastructure. So um, in, the, in the Lexis uh, project, uh, uh, um, part of the, of the time has been, uh, and, uh, uh, has been spent for um, uh, creating the, the, the right interface between these two um, key components. Uh, okay, there are no more uh, questions. So um, just to get uh, um, the, um, the the program, uh, the next uh, um, ne next uh, uh, presentation is the first uh, of the. can uh, give the virtual stage to um, to to Jean Thomas Okay, Jean Thomas, uh, you can uh, can you start uh, with your presentations? Okay, I can try to you. Okay, the option should be uh, enabled for all the panelists. So um, I don't know. Um, I can try to. Uh, 
I don't see you in the panelist list. I don't know, maybe you can try to reconnect. I think he's in the spectator uh, list. Yeah. Um... Okay, I think he, he will, he's trying to reconnect. Uh... I'm checking also that uh, everything is uh, fine with the um, with the panelist list. Yeah, it, it should be should be there in the panelist list. So. Is it better? Uh, okay. Uh, we can hear you, Jean Thomas. Yes, but um, hmm. ah, okay. I think I'm able to share my screen. Uh, let me check. Uh, no. Maybe I can try to uh, send you the. Um, Unlisting invitations. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, I did a mistake here. Just a moment. Okay. We sent the. Okay, I think I received something. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Uh, so I'm using the other link. Uh, I'm <laughs> back. Marvelous. <laughs> yeah. The magic of the technology. <laughs> Okay, so let's sh share the screen. Uh, so is it okay? Do you see the screen? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, so I apologize for the for the delay, but uh, you know, even after one year of virtual conference, I'm still not uh, used to. So this is an overview of the Evolve project. We are at year two over three years. So uh, I'm Jean-Thomas Cuiva from uh, DDN, but I'm the project coordinator for, for Evolve. So Evolve, as the other project in this workshop, is the ICT-11. Um, so we are a 19 partner, and we have a, a 14 million budget overall. In terms of organization between the partner, so there is a three basket, if I can mention this way. Uh, dissemination, communication, and coordination is uh, uh, handled by DDN and LOBA. And then we have the use case or pilot application provider. So they are um, developing applications. So there is, I will say, scientific uh, or industrial content in the application themselves. So. Uh, part of the output of the project is the results that we're going to, to get out of this application. 
and the, the involvement is uh, basically twofold in the sense that they are also uh, validating the, the infrastructure, the platform that uh, we are building. When I say we, this is uh, the partner at the bottom, the technology provider, where you can find some uh, pretty well-known names such as IBM and Bull, and there is our Atos Bull. So there is DDN also in for HPC, and we have um, uh, academic like ICCS or Force, or a more agile partner like uh, MemoScale on App and Sunlight, which are more like um, a startup. So overall, we have these two important layers, infrastructure, and at the top of it, people are using it and delivering their own uh, result. So the, the platform was very um, was really um, developed, I will say, with a focus on the end user. So for us, um, some key performance indicators are related to the use cases. So we want to deliver good performance, so taking a HPC. Uh, so we are basically bringing a HPC infrastructure, um, fast network, fast storage, fast processor. But we have to acknowledge that HPC is sometimes uh, uh, not the perfect tool for all problems. And there is a, a, a big data which is extremely efficient about uh, building complex workflow. So why in HPC, it's quite difficult to do code coupling, for example. If you want to connect a, an ocean model with the atmospheric one, it's a lot of work. But with big data, uh, these communities are really uh, able to build very complex pipeline and articulate application on workflow at large scale and they run everything on uh, commodity hardware. So here the interaction is quite obvious. We want to keep the good thing from the software stack, but some all streamline, streamline it and remove some of the software which is here to provide the redundancy on fault tolerance because we are inserting underneath HPC hardware. And the, the third uh, pillar, I should say, is from cloud. So for those who have been in the community since a few years, we have really uh, observed the, the boom of cloud. And we have to acknowledge that uh, they were able to answer to some uh, lingering questions that were in the community before. It's extremely easy to deploy uh, an application in cloud. You can virtualize an environment and deploy in a snap, while for uh, Previously on HPC on other kind of infrastructure, it was much more difficult. So cloud is really a productivity uh, tool, which is um, something that we have a lot of lessons to, to learn from. In terms of use cases, um, so as in the other project, we try to, to bring in some uh, new application. Here in our case, we have three partners who are working on uh, satellite images. So these data, the, the images are coming from the European Copernicus uh, satellite constellation. And you exploiting this image, we can do several um, uh, process. So there is Sibel Tech on the try to, uh, to deliver agriculture optimization. So looking at the satellite images, they want to inform the agriculture about the status of the crop. So if there is anything to do in terms of uh, providing intrant or just monitoring if the, the crop is growing correctly. Uh, Thales Alenia Space, they are doing change detection. So here they involve AI to detect if there is any change on the ground uh, in respect of uh, picture taking from the same area at different time. So basically it's a way to observe, for instance, uh, the expansion of suburban area or even there is some link with agriculture. One of their use cases, for instance, is to, to evaluate the damage which has been caused by a frost episode in the vineyard in France. And you know, in France, wine is a very important. And the third, uh, the third use case, Space Elas, uh, I think it's even more important, actually. Uh, it's uh, um, security and sovereignty application. So they, they want to be able to detect and to track a non-cooperative vessel in the Mediterranean which means both which are somewhat cheating with their uh, location um, to the control authority. So they, they want to be able to detect this and to, to track their, um, their path. We have also uh, several use cases for mobility. So mobility, it's really in the broad sense of the world. Of the world. So there is 
personal vehicle. So AVL, it's um, a partner in Austria and they are developing a model for predictive maintenance. So they probe the engine and they observe all the variation. And if the engine start to, to misbehave in respect of his uh, expected behavior, then it can hint that we may have uh, an issue in the nearby future. So it brings us to the uh, second partner, Kula, who is using AI in order to optimize the maintenance. So basically using a very large database and some AI for a given failure in a, in a car, they can uh, provide hint about the best way to, to maintain and to repair it. And there is two other mobility uh, providers. So BMW, they are developing a ride hailing uh, algorithm. So it's kind of, if you want, so kind of similar to Uber. So there is a, a set of people asking for a ride and there is a set of available car. And then we want to compute the, the most efficient way for the car to provide services to the, to the user. Um, it's not a, a Uber app, it's more like um, a science. So they are really tackling the, um, the core of the algorithmic problem uh, and they want to run it and accelerate it on the, on the platform. On the last partner, it's actually two partners. It's a couple from uh, Italy, uh, TMA and Memex. So uh, TMA is operating a fleet of uh, bus, so it's public transportation in Tuscany. On Memex, they are developing software in order to optimize the fleet management and to track the, uh, the bus location and to, to reshuffle uh, the, the bus traffic in case of hazard. So now if we go to the, to the infrastructure itself, the, the platform, so Evolve is about heterogeneity. So I think you already touched a, a lot of point with Lexis. So here, what is, uh, I will say, a traditional cluster up to maybe two years ago, a cluster used to be uh, completely homogeneous. So you have a C or very large array of processing units. They are all similar. They are interconnected with a very fast network and they share the common resource, which is like the storage. So in terms of resource allocation, it means that if we want to deploy an application in this cluster, we have to take care about the, the number of processing units and some more the capacity uh, of the storage that we want to allocate to the application. And that's kind of it. We can do some kind of optimization about you know, the topology, trying to allocate a nearby processor in order to accelerate the processing, but there is not that much complexity here. And in terms of monitoring, system monitoring, there is three main resources to, to monitor, the CPU load, the network uh, traffic, and the, the storage activity. Now, if we go for heterogeneous platform, as you did for, for Lexis, things start to become a bit more complicated. Instead of having a symmetric uh, set of processing units, now you see that these um, yellow boxes are very different. Some of them are accelerated, either with GPU, so this is uh, the green uh, part at the top of the, of the picture, or with FPGA, so this is the blue part at the bottom. And even within the, the processing unit, some of them has been not accelerated, but enhanced in the sense that we have uh, insert additional storage directly within the node. So there is fast NVMe in a subset of the, of the node available on the system. So this NVMe, they allow to, to do um, uh, read and write uh, without going through the network. So it's read local data. It's, they are not shared, but there is no uh, network overhead to access to this data. And if we want to go through the network and access to the storage, the storage is tiered. So there is a first tier, which is a, a burst buffer that uh, SDDN we are providing. Um, we have a, with a, a modified or extended version for the project. And beyond the burst buffer, then we can go to the capacity tiers, which is a parallel file system with um, drive. So now the, the two questions, the two problems that we had in terms of resource allocation, it's becoming more complicated because we have a different set of processing units. So we need a way to evaluate which one is the most, um, the, the best match for a given application. So we need to have some characterization of the application and some characterization of the processing unit in order to do this matching algorithm. And the, it's the same thing for the storage. So it's not only about the, the, the size of the data that we want to, to accommodate, but 
are we going to um, host the data locally within the node on the NVMe, so it's fast access, or is it really very large on regular access so it can fit uh, in the parallel file system? So the resource allocation problem is becoming a bit more complex. And similarly, or should I say maybe consequently, the monitoring of the system itself also is more complicated because we have no uh, different set of metrics since we have different uh, components. And furthermore, one important point is the data locality. So even if I'm allocating the, the application on the best node, maybe I've I have also to take care about the data placement if I want to, to have the best performance. So overall, we are not doing this for the, the beauty of the art. There is some compensation for the people who are porting their application. So Space CLS, the Maritime Surveillance Application I, I was mentioning previously, starting from day one to two years later, they were able to accelerate their, their application by more than 100. Uh, by uh, porting the app and taking advantage of the GPU and the parallelism. And there is also, it's not only pure speed up, there is also some kind of uh, qualitative enhancements. So for example, the visualization module here that you can see on the snapshot is directly interested, uh, inserted within the software stack. Uh, bon, I will not detail uh, too much the, the visualization part uh, in this talk, but we have a, a microservice dedicated to data visualization. On the right part of the slide, there is a, a picture of the system, which is hosted uh, like Lexis in a bull facility in France. So it means that since we have heterogeneous resources, we also have to tackle uh, um, uh, the, prog the programming model. So it, it's more complex to, to program an application when we have to deal with multiple kind of uh, processing units. So it means that if we want to have distributed uh, large scale application, we need to have uh, MPI, so distributed memory parallelism. Within a single node, we can leverage a multi core aspect uh, using OpenMP, shared parallelism. And we also have to, to harness the FPGA. And I've mentioned Dask uh, on this slide because this is something which is, at least for me, quite interesting. We start with very uh, a low level MPI on those, there is this Python library, which is somehow uh, uh, hiding the complexity of MPI on allowing the Python developer to, to have access to parallel uh, programming, distributed uh, programming. So data management. Um, so as I was mentioning uh, earlier, there is uh, quite a, uh, some work which has been done in Evolve related to, to data management. So in terms of infrastructure, there is a, this S3 service, which is developed by Force. And this is a way that we are using the local NVMe within the node. And so for the node, which has been extended with NVMe, they can use this service to have a, a local key value store. So with very good performance, and we can also um, move the data out of the local node uh, automatically, thanks to, the, to this service. And there is also the burst buffer, so it's dis disaggregated in the case of, of Evolve, which means that all the NVMe has been taken in a specific set of appliances. There is more than 100 of them. And this uh, layer of uh, NVMe is basically uh, transparently moving data back and forth with the uh, parallel file system. So it's transparent for the end user. If the burst buffer is filling up, then data move to luster and at the opposite. If uh, there is a lot of demand for a particular data set, the data are prefetched from a luster, from the parallel file system to the burst buffer. So it's kind of transparent for the end user. So the data management is not only a question of infrastructure. So there is also um, a, a data set lifecycle framework uh, developed by uh, IBM. So the idea is that you can attach your data set to a container, and when you move the container, the data set will automatically be relocated uh, to, to the right place. And one of the nice results in Evolve is that um, this software has been pushed open source by IBM, so we are quite proud of it. And obviously, we need something to hide the complexity, to shield the end user from all the low level details of the platform. And there is a lot of work in Evolve which has been done 
to, to hide this, to encode a workflow, and to provide a notebook. So Christos in the uh, technical talk for Evolve will detail this uh, much more than me. And there is this uh, data visualization module that uh, I was mentioning as well, which is based on uh, web lizard technology, a startup in Australia. And it's quite, quite cool, actually. So in terms of monitoring, so we did a lot of effort to integrate some of our proprietary tools, uh, for instance, on the software uh, part, on the storage part. We integrate the proprietary tools within the Prometheus uh, framework. So it's an open source project, which has quite a momentum at the moment. So by providing connector, now we can integrate everything in a single interface. Uh, and it's reusing a lot of um, this open source uh, project. So it's quite good in terms of software maintenance for us. So what do we get uh, from this? I would say that when we start the project, if we look at the big data on HPC uh, software stack, so it's not my slide, I stole it from, from BDEC. There is a big data one on the left, um, on the HPC one on the right, and you see that they are kind of um, independent silo. They all rely on Linux, but there is a, these two communities that build their software stack kind of independently one from the other. And what we are trying to do in Evolve is to integrate as much as possible and to provide bridges in order to have a single software stack, which is able to provide the big data services, but directly connected to the HPC uh, infrastructure without going through all this uh, Hadoop stack, uh, such as HDFA, something like that. So when we start the project, we have identified some um, issue, some challenges for the community. So the first one is that HPC is powerful, but sometimes people are a bit reluctant to use it because um, uh, the user experience is not very good. All right, it's complicated to program. Uh, the tools are a bit archaic. And also furthermore, if you have a complicated pipeline, maybe you do not need to use HPC for everything. There are some stages which are very simple and you need to reshuffle your data or something like that. And it could be three lines of Python, but if you want to do this in Fortran, it's going to be a, a bit more messy. So here the idea is that maybe for this component, which are more oriented toward user service and not that much for performance, we should move to something more um, user-friendly and this is bringing uh, the big data in the picture actually so big data very nice uh, the community the software stack is uh, assuming that they are running on commodity hardware so they are providing a lot of uh, software layer to prevent and tolerate failure of the hardware they are not taking into account i will say the, um, some of um, the performance that uh, the hardware, non-commodity, but specialized hardware can provide. I'm thinking specifically about the, the network. So when you are using a fast infinite band network, your data are much more uh, close to the processing unit than when you are using a very slow Ethernet. So it means that maybe there is less need to cache within the memory of the node, for instance. So you can uh, alleviate the memory footprint because the data is quite close in terms of latency thanks to this fast network. So yes, yeah, this is the articulation really between HPC and big data. So in terms of results, so uh, Space LS is clearly uh, our, our champion here with a, a speed up of more than 100, but the other application, they have not been fully port yet to the, to the system, I have, I have to say, but on the component which has been port, we have been enjoying um, nice speed up. So very nice speed up uh, due to the better storage uh, management, due to the um, increasing increased level of parallelism. And also, and more importantly, uh, specifically for, for user friendliness, the way that the pipeline are encoded are now, um, it's more convenient, it's more compact. So it's a bit difficult to to estimate the gain. So we choose this idea of number of line of code, but basically we can orchestrate a workflow um, with a small YAML file right before it was uh, much more cumbersome to, to articulate. 
and also from infrastructure standpoint. So heterogeneity. Uh, so there is a shared agreement in the community that uh, okay, more low is basically reaching a uh, eating a wall, and we need to to provide accelerator. So general purpose uh, CPU are not going to to keep the pace. But the question is that how do we um, inject heterogeneity within the cluster? Do we have um, CPU which are all accelerated? So there is small accelerator on all CPU, and we end up with a homogeneous, uh, heterogeneous processing unit. Or do we have uh, an independent cluster, like uh, the modular architecture in Ulich, for instance, in Germany? And what we have in Evolve is that we have heterogeneity at the node level. So the cluster is heterogeneous by nodes, so some nodes are accelerated, not the other. And in terms of resource management and orchestration, uh, we think it's quite a good approach. So this is maybe the, the, the way to push for future iteration of the project or even in terms of architecture engineering. We still have some open challenges, so I was very uh, interested by the presentation of Lexis. For instance, Evolve is very focused on on-premise. So we are running everything within the, this data center uh, of Atos, but we have no interaction with the open world. So uh, nowadays, we are not only required to be able to connect to the cloud, but even to have a multi-cloud policies to be able to, to access data, which are maybe dispatched on several clouds. So this is something which I think is still missing to the project. It was not in the scope of the proposal, of course, but I think now that we have a bit of uh, feedback two years later, this is really the, the next frontier, specifically if we put um, the edge also. So how could we in, um, integrate a heterogeneous platform within a multi-cloud and edge uh, environment? In terms of workflow, I think we still have some progress to make. Uh, so to define the data placement, the optimal data placement. So I think there is some uh, lesson to to take for or from other communities. So I'm speaking, spe I'm thinking specifically about the weather community. And also debugging a workflow is quite complicated. So if the result is not coming fast enough, uh, you have to do some kind of uh, uh, reverse engineering to identify the slow component and then understand why is it slow? Is it because the data was not in the right place? Is it because the code is not fast enough? So there is a lot of things here which remain to be to be done. And also related to open source. So definitively, I'm now 100% uh, convinced that uh, open source is a way to go if we want to maintain uh, the technology which has been uh, developed within a, a European project after the life of the project. So after the three years of the project, if we want to avoid that all the, the technology is basically put on shelf and take dust, then we have to make it live in open source project. And an open source project is more than just, you know, putting everything on a Git repository, but it's more pushing the key technological element in an independent project and pushing this upstream. So this is what we have tried to, that we are trying to do actually, so to push code upstream, for example, in Zeppelin, we have pushed uh, some patches also uh, in MPI to be sure that there is some kind of perennity of the investment here. So if I can try to summarize the project in one slide, I would say that from an infrastructure standpoint, we have built an heterogeneous system, which is probably not optimal, but it works quite well. And we have been able to attract a POC, and uh, it has led to a lot of innovation. So we have submitted something like 15 uh, uh, innovation opportunities to the reviewer, to the project reviewer. And in terms of software, um, if we look at these two different software stack, actually, building connection is not that much complicated. There is not rocket science to be involved. It's, uh, it's work for sure. But I think it's kind of um, a reachable goal to have a fast big data uh, software stack running on the top of HPC hardware. And still about software, uh, clearly we've seen a, a huge um, expectation from the end user, from the application end user about container and a notebook. 
So the, the traditional SSH on batch, maybe this is no longer the way to go and we have to start to write uh, YAML code. That's, uh, that's my take for today. So if you have any question, otherwise uh, there is lunch. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Jean-Thomas, for a uh, uh, very interesting uh, presentation from uh, uh, Evolve Project. Um, I think that maybe uh, since uh, we are almost, uh, we are close to the break, uh, break time for lunch, um we can uh, uh we can uh, uh, postpone uh questions for uh related to evolve project also after the uh the second presentation from uh, your colleague uh, christos sure uh peace uh, uh to every everybody uh have a good good lunch uh break um enjoy the um, the, the keynote speech uh, for, from the main IP conference and uh, join us again after uh, after uh, after this thank you thank you later bye 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 Uh, do you guys uh, see my, my slides? They should read Evolve. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alberto. Uh, I am Christos Kozanetis. I work at uh, Forth in Crete and uh, uh, we collaborate at Project Evolve with uh, Jean Thomas. Uh, in this session, uh, I will. Uh, uh, I know that Jean Thomas uh, gave you an, uh, a more high level speech uh, before uh, the break. Now I'm going to dive into a couple of topics that uh, we're working on uh, the, la the last uh, couple of uh, years. Uh, what, uh, what we're doing, everything that we're doing in Evolve is orchestrated by Kubernetes, uh, but of course, uh, we had to take some action to uh, to jump some obstacles. The first, the very first uh, step that we had to take was the container the containerization of HPC workloads and, uh, in particular, MPI workloads. We know that uh, people in HPC usually use singular containers, but uh, most of my, but most of our partners come from uh, the big data world and uh, they had their applications already in uh, Docker containers. The second part uh, of my talk is going to uh, jump into some research problems that we're doing with uh, Kubernetes resource allocation. And we will see how we can automat automatically allocate resources to big data workloads that are usually uh, elastic. The, the, the first topic uh, is the containerization, the Docker con containerization of MPI containers, of MPI programs. What, uh, what we do with, uh, Doc with Kubernetes is uh, that we create what we call virtual clusters. So uh, an MPI application runs on uh, virtual clusters of uh, Docker containers. And uh, what is the special of those? What is the specialty of those uh, virtual clusters? Is that uh, uh, we, we assume that uh, every every Docker, that every pod that uh, uh, that we that we launch uh, has access to two network interfaces. One normal Ethernet network interfaces that uh, we assign for Kubernetes uh, related I/O. And one uh, infiniband and one uh, high-speed infiniband uh, network 
that uh, we dedicate that we dedicated for uh, uh, the networking for the networking needs of the NPI application. Uh, in Evolve, uh, we have uh, in, InfiniBand Mellanox drivers, so uh, we use the, in, the Mellanox drivers uh, uh, inside the Docker containers. Uh, now, if someone doesn't have uh, InfiniBand cards and uh, they use uh, RDMA through, uh, uh, through RDMA over converged inter, uh, Ethernet, then one can use um, um, the Multos drivers from Intel to uh, create their uh, containers. Uh, inside uh, virtual clusters, uh, we take care of, uh, uh, of, of the authorization details. Uh, we create, we automatically manage, uh, uh, we automatically manage uh, SSA keys and uh, host files and stuff like that. And uh, we also allow uh, the front end of Evolve, which is which either runs on notebooks or on uh, workflows, to transparently uh, create virtual clusters and uh, launch MPI applications to those virtual clusters. And uh, we make sure that uh, we don't have, we don't have any performance losses with uh, this process. And uh, we, we have numbers that show uh, that uh, the performance of uh, the Docker containerization of MPI gives close to bare metal performance. And here are some uh, benchmarks. Uh, we have uh, tried uh, four uh, routines from uh, the NAS benchmark suite. And we, com we compared their bare metal performance uh, versus uh, the performance of the setup over uh, Kubernetes and uh, Docker containers. And as you can see, with orange, we plot the performance of bare metal. With purple, we plot the performance of uh, the Kubernetes performance. And as you can see, uh, there are only a few seconds, only a cap one or 2% uh, difference between the bare metal and Kubernetes. So where uh, the performance wise, the HPC benchmarks are close enough to bare metal. The next, the next, uh, uh, the, the next experiment that we did for performance reasons was uh, to make sure that the scalability is close to linear. We used uh, three NAS benchmarks, a basically parallel uh, conjug conjugate gradient and uh, multigrid. And uh, we did the experiments with up to eight nodes, nodes on the Evolve platform. It's called uh, Nova internally. So if you see numbers that say Nova, it means the Evolve platform. Uh, each node uh, offers 48 threads, and each test uses uh, 32 processes per node. And here, here, are, here is the scalability of multi-grid uh, when it runs with uh, uh, Kubernetes and uh, Docker containers, as you can see, as we double uh, the nodes, the, uh, the performance, uh, the execution time uh, goes down by uh, at half at each step. Similarly, for uh, the para uh, parallel benchmark, the, the, the uh, the speed up is also linear as we double the nodes. Uh, the performance goes exactly uh, at half of the, of the previous uh, step. And uh, uh, similar numbers we observe uh, with uh, the consulate. Yes. Uh, and similar numbers we observe with uh, on, 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 now this, the numbers are not that similar, but uh, we saw uh, a good scalability. Uh, actually, when we go from two nodes to four nodes, the conjugate, the conjugate, uh, the conjugate gradient uh, execution time drops down by more than two times, and in the other cases. Uh, the speed up is close to uh, 2x. 
Uh, now I will uh, switch to the second topic, which uh, uh, talks about the automatic resource allocation on uh, Kubernetes. Uh, but first, let's take a look how Kubernetes uh, works. Uh, the Kubernetes scheduler receives uh, requests to schedule a new pod, and oh, they receive uh, a request to launch a new pod, and the request contains uh, a script that among gathers and uh, lets the Kubernetes know that, hey, take uh, uh, this, uh, uh, I would like a pod from that image and I would like to schedule, uh, and I would like to allocate the, uh, that many numbers of CPUs and that amount of memory. And the Kubernetes uh, maintains a list of uh, available resources on every node and it uses uh, a predicate that ranks those uh, nodes and then with some heuristic picks the best uh, node for a request. Now I would like to focus on the initial assumption. Kubernetes assumes that the user, someone externally, uh, is able to specify a reservation. Some user, is, uh, Kubernetes expects from all users to specify that their workloads uh, require uh, a specific amount of resources to reserve. Now, unsurprisingly, uh, it is widely uh, observed over the last 10 years or so that users generally overestimate the amount of resources that they reserve. And uh, this is uh, a this is a plot from uh, a paper from Christos Kozirakis and Christina Delimitro from uh, 2014, the Quasar paper, where the authors measured uh, real workloads in Google and Twitter, and they saw that uh, the amount of resources that uh, people reserve versus the amount of resources that people actually use uh, has a wide gap in uh, between two and five times. Uh, there is a difference between two and five times, which is waste. Now, why people can, uh, why someone might uh, want to reserve more res resources than what they actually need, uh, there are two reasons. One is because they can, because uh, they have access to a large platform that their employer pays for it, or because they plan for the, wor for the worst case. Perhaps they plan that uh, uh, once in, a, in the lifetime of uh, a task, uh, someone might need might need all of those resources, but this might be a tiny amount of the entire execution uh, time of a task. And here is uh, the question that we make: uh, What if uh, we automate resource allocation? What, uh, what? How about letting Kubernetes decide how many resources an application needs uh, to run? And uh, the opportunity, uh, the opportunity that here is that unlike HPC workloads that usually are uh, uh, rigid, which means uh, MPI usually requires all uh, uh, all resources up front in order uh, to start running. In big data, big data workloads are elastic. They can start working with a small amount of resources and uh, when they have access to more resources, they can expand and take uh, whatever resources uh, are provided to them. Uh, uh, now, of course, there are some difficulties and the difficulty is uh, 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 that someone needs to, that uh, Kubernetes needs to be able to monitor the target performance and uh, uh, adjust uh, allocations in order to satisfy target performance. And uh, also, we should not forget that when we, uh, that, uh, when, uh, uh, we make, when we make Kubernetes dockers linear, uh, and we start fitting more uh, dockers, more tasks on a single server, then there might be uh, uh, there might be the interference problems that were uh, uh, running uh, containers uh, have uh, uh, competence for compute resources, and then the performance uh, slows down. And if we look at the literature on uh, on uh, this uh, automatic resource allocation, 
we will see that uh, most uh, that most uh, approaches use some kind of uh, machine learning, either on profile runs, they profile one application multiple times, and then uh, they make a decision of what is an optimal uh, resource allocation for that application, or on historic traces. Uh, people make the assumption that uh, one person, one uh, uh, customer is going to run the same thing again and again every day. And uh, they use the historic performance of their, uh, uh, of their of that application in order uh, to predict the, re the resource needs of that user in the future. Now, there are some problems with, uh, those, uh, uh, with those approaches. approaches. First, a lot of time is spent when we talk about the profiling grants. First, a lot of time is spent in profiling. Perhaps we don't have the luxury of uh, uh, going offline and do a lot of uh, profiling runs. Plus, programs constantly change performance behavior. It's not uh, nobody can guarantee that uh, the pro one program that behaves in one way uh, in a sandbox, when it gets deployed in production, is going to behave, behave uh, the same way. And so our machine learning becomes uh, uh, efficient. If someone looks at historic traces, on the other hand, there are some problems there because uh, according to a paper from Microsoft called Morpheus, Morpheus in OSDI a couple of years ago, uh, only 70% of, uh, workload, of workloads are re recurrent. So one might expect that a good amount of workloads uh, come with no known history. And for this reason, we have uh, implemented uh, Skynet. Skynet uh, is implemented as a Kubernetes scheduler, and uh, it expects user, instead of entering the amount of resources that uh, they wish to reserve, they enter a target performance in terms of throughput or in terms of latency. Uh, then uh, uh, Skynet, uh, uh, then the Kubernetes scheduler, uh, uh, is equipped with some monitoring activity. Jean Thomas uh, mentioned uh, that monitoring activity in his uh, previous uh, presentation, uh, which is basically on the Prometheus uh, service. Uh, so Skynet monitors uh, that activity and it uses the numbers that uh, it gets from that activity in order to uh, in order to uh, in order to adjust the allocation that uh, it performs and, uh, the, and the algorithm that uh, the skynet uses is the pid controller i'm going to talk about that in uh, a couple of slides but first let's draw now the new picture of uh, the kubernetes uh, scheduler now, the Kubernetes scheduler became a bit more complex. Instead of the two, instead of the two uh, elements that uh, appear in the bottom, now we have two more elements. One is the monitoring service, service that uh, Jean Thomas uh, provides and uh, collects uh, performance statistics from all running uh, containers. Plus, there is the resource allocation module that uh, uh, receives the uh, uh, requests from uh, uh, for launching uh, different pods and uh, creates uh, uh, and calculates an allocation. In addition, Skynet also uh, uh, makes resizing requests. Uh, apart from setting a, uh, apart from setting a pod somewhere and let it there running, uh, it. When it, when it comes uh, at the point when uh, Skynet finds that uh, uh, that uh, application needs to get readjusted, it sends a signal and it resizes the container. Either it makes it bigger or it makes it uh, smaller. And as I said earlier, Skynet is the algorithm that Skynet uses is based on the PID controller. Uh, this is a closed loop system and uh, it constantly uh, calculates an error function, uh, which is the difference between the target performance and the observed performance. And then it, uh, it, uses, it calculates a correction function, which is uh, the sum of, uh, three, uh, of three elements. Uh, the P term, which is 
something which is proportional to the error function. The i term, which is the integral of uh, the error function, and it calculates it from uh, 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 from the area that uh, uh, from the from the area that is uh, uh, that gets created from all previous observations, and then uh, the d term, which is uh, the derivative of the error function. Uh, At this moment, I'm, uh, go I'm going to show you uh, a demo from uh, Skynet, and uh, we use uh, the memcached in order to uh, in order to have a workload demo. Memcached is, is a distributed in-memory key value store, and uh, we are going to run uh, the Yahoo Cloud Serving bench Benchmark YCSB uh, in order to. Uh, uh, to see how Mem how Skynet uh, adjust uh, adjusts resources. Uh, now, on the left part of the screen, uh, there is a terminal that uh, initiates uh, all uh, services. Uh, at some point, at some moment, uh, we're going to start services. Scheduler is running. And uh, at some po uh, moment, things are going to start running. And on the right hand uh, side of the screen, uh, we have the uh, uh, we have a plot that is going to, that uh, contains the following elements. Uh, the left uh, the left y axis uh, shows the performance, and uh, the, uh, and the performance the target performance is the red the red line. And uh, when things start running, there will be a green a green line that will show the observed performance. Uh, there are three uh, right y axis uh, axis that uh, show uh, the different uh, resources uh, cpu memory and network now things have started running we have started with a very small initial allocation uh, skynet sensed that it needs to increase the resources that allocates and as the experiment progresses uh, the allocations that skynet uh, uh, sends to this workload also increase. And uh, this is going to happen until, uh, until the, the green line uh, meets the red line. At some moment, when uh, this is going to happen, we're going to make a change. We're going to edit the configuration file, uh, the, the YAML file of Kubernetes, and uh, we will decide to drop the red to drop the red line. In some moments, you will see that the red line uh, decreases in a smaller uh, uh, in a smaller uh, amount. Now we have changed uh, the red line, and Skynet is going to pick up this change. It will uh, notice that uh, now. Uh, the resource allocation uh, is too large, and it will start uh, lowering the resources until the green line uh, converges again with uh, the red line. And that's the end of uh, the video. Now, what it means, uh, what this process tells us uh, for any HPC MPI uh, runs. Uh, we have uh, made the runs with uh, MPI workloads uh, to run in parallel uh, at the same hardware at the same time with the big data workloads. And uh, here is a plot of uh, the NAS benchmarks. There are two plots, there are two bars in this, uh, there are two sets of bars in uh, this picture. The, uh, the yellow set of, uh, the yellow set of, uh, of bars is the baseline, is uh, what is the performance of the MPI programs when uh, we manually, uh, uh, when we manually enter a static uh, allocation. The, 
blue, the blue set of bars is the performance of the same benchmarks when it runs again with uh, uh, the benchmark of the previous experiment. But at, the, at this time, we let Skynet decide automatically how many resources uh, to assign to the big data workload. And uh, this is uh, an, early, an early measurement, and we see that uh, the, blue uh, the blue bar is 10% uh, better than the yellow bar. And uh, uh, now we don't have it in our slides, but uh, we have made some improvements, and we have been able to decrease, uh, to, to increase this gap and make it 30% in the latest uh, runs. Uh, this is the end of uh, the talk that uh, I have prepared. Uh, if there are any questions, I will be happy to, uh, to discuss. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Christian. Um, yeah, actually there are, um, there is one question from uh, uh, one of the uh, attendees. Um, is uh, I just read that the question uh, is Did you compare the performance also on a regular HPC cluster? And if I correctly understood, uh, it was referred when you shown the um, uh, performance comparison between uh, uh, the, the dockerized uh, application. That's versus, correct. That's uh, correct. Yes. Yes, Alberto, that's exactly what we did in those plots. Okay. Uh, I have uh, some other two questions related to um, the, um, the work you presented from in, uh, uh, in the schedule. Uh, uh, you, you, you extended the, basically the Kubernetes uh, uh, scheduling system, if I correctly understood. Um, this is very interesting. Um, uh, I was curious to just to understand because from your um, uh, the the schema you present in the, the slides, um, mm -hmm. you have uh, uh, a node scoring uh, module that was, uh, if I again correctly understood, uh, uh, yeah, the, um, already there in the uh, Kubernetes uh, um, implementation, mm -hmm. and you added the Sky, Skynet resource allocation. Uh, I was curious to understand uh, um, which is the, the difference between these two mod modules. Uh, I mean, uh, in my, my understanding, uh, um, uh, I w what, what I expect is uh, when you uh, allocate something, uh, at the end you, uh, you already uh, scored. Um, okay, that's a great question. Uh, separated stuff or again that's a great question let's let me first make uh, go through the terminology uh, when we say resource allocation is the decision that one program needs a certain amount of resources and then there is the other ter term which is usually called uh, called uh, uh, resource assignment or workload placement which is the decision that this workload with uh, uh, this amount of resources is going to run in that node. Uh, in Kubernetes, there are two. Uh, so in Kubernetes, there are two uh, two worlds. What is uh, on top, which is the world of application, and what what is in bottom, which is the world of the available resources. And uh, Kubernetes knows every single time. Uh, what, uh, which of uh, the resources uh, are busy and, uh, which, and what nodes have available resources. Uh, when it comes to placement of a work, to a placement of a container of a task, the Kubernetes uh, goes through the available nodes and decides with some heuristic. By default, I think it's the minimum load. I'm not really sure which one is the default, but. Uh, it's pretty open. You can customize it with whatever uh, heuristic that you like. And it ranks the available nodes that can run one workload uh, according to some predicate. So what happens in the bottom of this picture, or in the bottom part of Kubernetes scheduler, has to do with fighting, fighting the best node to run a workload 
given that we know the resources that uh, it needs to run. It needs so much, so much, uh, so many CPUs, so much memory, so much network. And what Skynet is doing is adds a, an extra logic when, when it comes to how many resources uh, a particular workload needs. I'm, I'm not sure if this answers your question. No, no, it's, uh, it's clear. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, understood the, the, the point. Um, maybe I, there is still time for just a very quick uh, question. Uh, I have, uh, um, how much time uh, your approach uh, uh, does it take to, to, uh, to adapt the performance to the, to the objective? Uh? Mm -hmm. In this experiment that uh, we start uh, in a brute force way with the minimum possible allocation, it takes about a minute to uh, to converge. But of course, we can uh, extend that and make a smarter initial guess with the historic, doing some machine learning with historic performances of known tasks and approach more aggressively uh, the initial uh, recommendation. Okay. Thank you again, uh, Christos, for Thank you, Alberto. your, uh, your uh, talk. Uh, of course, uh, um, if um, someone has uh, other uh, questions uh, uh, or uh, comments on uh, all the presentation, uh, uh, please uh, uh, write on the on the on the chat or on the question and answer, and uh, I will try to collect uh, all of them and uh, uh, maybe try to. Uh, pass them to the, uh, the speakers and get uh, maybe offline uh, answer. Okay, the next uh, next presentation comes from uh, Deep Health uh, uh, ICT 11 project. So um, I would like to invite on virtual okay. stage, uh, um, yeah. Monica. Yeah, let me one moment. I didn't check, and I have the here. One moment. Yeah, yeah. I have a, a strange virtual background. I prefer not to use it. <laughs> and I don't remember how to remove it. <laughs> how to remove it. Exactly, exactly. I think, well, that's at least I think that's better. Sorry, sorry about that. I think that's better. The other was on another talk, so it's not, it was not really appropriate. <laughs> So let me also share, share my screen. Okay, so I guess you are seeing it. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So thanks uh, for good afternoon to everyone, of course. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Alberto, for organizing this uh, interesting workshop. And it's, it's, Really, I'm really glad to be here again with all ICT level projects. So let me present myself. I'm Monica Caballero. I'm the coordinator of the Deep Health project. And as you are aware of, the, the idea today is uh, in my talk is to provide an overview of the project and the progress so far. Now that we are finalizing the second year. After that, uh, my colleague Eduardo will be providing a more technical oriented speech with more details. So let's just to summarize that uh, that Deep Health is a is a project that aims to push the use of technology uh, in the health domain in order to create or to boost new, more efficient biomedical image applications for the diagnosis, the monitoring, and the treatment of diseases. It's a project that it's coordinated by Everest with the support of the Politecnica University of Valencia in the technical management. Just uh, to provide you some key facts about the project, as the other uh, projects started in January 2019, and until now, uh, it, uh, it still lasts uh, 36 months. We are, since the COVID, we are now about to decide if, if extension is needed. The budget is uh, above 14 million euros, and we, we have a consortium to, to make it possible from a composed of 22 partners that comes from nine different countries. And these include research centers, 
that mo are mostly focused on the, uh, the, the scientific development of the project, health organizations mostly, but not only lead in all our use cases, and then industry, of course, uh, uh, leading technical developments and also providing health platforms and artificial intelligence platforms to the project which uh, we have both large industries and SMEs. So here you have all the different logos. We are 22, uh, a, lot of, a lot of partners. But let's start from, from the beginning and presenting the main problem we address in the project. So you know that healthcare is the key sector in the global economy. So any little improvement we can make in the healthcare systems can have a really great impact on society and the public budgets. And Deep Health is focused on the scenarios where image is uh, processing, is needed for the diagnosis. And sorry, and we realized at the beginning when, when thinking about the project that the European public health systems were generating a large quantity of, of, the, of data sets of biomedical uh, data, in particular images that really are not fully exploited. Since most of its value come from the interpretation manual, uh, inter uh, manual interpretation of the expert. Normally you go to the doctor to get a scan and the doctor sees the image and diagnoses or analyzes it or whatever. So it's not a uh, very um, a suitable solution that has been applied uh, widely in the recent years is uh, to use uh, artificial intelligence and in particular deep learning techniques to support all the health professionals and exploit all the available data that is being generated. So this is the scenario, uh, this is the scenario where deep health is, is uh, focused on. We have the doctor that uh, it gets um, an image from a scan, it ingests it into uh, an application, a software platform that uses predictive models gets a prediction uh, that uh, a hint to support uh, his diagnose. Also doctors are the ones that uh, have the knowledge to level the different images. So we can pass to the, to the right to where we have the training environment and we have our ICT experts. So they gather all the images that are leveled. They set up biomedical image data sets and train predictive models after that, they load to the software uh, platforms of your medical application so the medical people can use it. The thing is that we're talking about the learning and we're talking about learning uh, with uh, images. We're talking about very computational uh, expensive algorithms and big data workloads. So this takes a lot of time. So why not adding HPC and cloud infrastructure to this equation? and to overcome all this timing issue. The thing is, uh, what happens here is that, as you are aware and has been commented in previous presentations, the, um, these two walls, the deep learning and the HPC wall are really the couple. So it's not straightforward how to, to, how to exploit or how to link the libraries and the, the HPC and cloud infrastructures. And most important, the ICT experts, the AI experts, are normally not uh, not expert on HPC. So, how to make it easy for them to to exploit all of these compu computational resources for deep learning purposes? So, in these scenarios where the health puts uh, their uh, their goals, the first one, the general one, is to put high performance computing power at the service of these biomedical applications that have needs of deep learning and computer vision. This translates into three different objectives. Looking for more the AI perspective, uh, Deep Health aims to increase the productivity of these uh, IT experts when they are training all these predictive models without all the knowledge of all the different tools that are available right now, both for deep learning and for the computer vision part. Adding the HPC perspective, we want to offer a unified framework that allows to train these models, but exploiting underlying heterogeneous HPC and cloud infrastructures. And not only that, but we want really to reach the industry and the society. So we want to really 
reduce this gap between the availability of these technologies and their, their actual use in, in health premises. So that's why we another objective is to improve these uh, medical software platforms. So they include this uniform framework. See more graphically in this hour scenario, the goals translate into three main areas of work the Deep Health Toolkit and the HPC Cloud Infrastructure Support that together will allow the IT staff to train the models and over uh, hybrid uh, heterogeneous HPC and cloud infrastructures without, and this is important, a profound knowledge on deep, health, um, deep learning, sorry, big data or, a, or HPC uh, and do it faster, of course. And on the other hand, we have the uh, enhanced biomedical applications that can leverage on the toolkit and the, and the infrastructure, HPC and cloud infrastructure support for bringing out to for the for training models or for inference or for inference operations and bring at the end the benefits to the health professionals and the patients at the end. So let's take a, a deeper look at the different developments and, and resources in these three areas of work and comment on the status uh, nowadays. The first main development is the Deep Health Toolkit. And it's composed of uh, two open source libraries, the European Distributed Deep Learning Library and the European Computer Vision Library that work together to train predictive models and, and perform inference and they are ready to, uh, to, to, to exploit these heterogeneous uh, infrastructures um, after that. Deep learning, the, the, European, the EDL, so that's the acronym, it provides uh, distributed deep learning and tensor operation features. It also includes on an accelerization to facilitate importing and exporting models and also provides compatibility with other very uh, famous and, and widely used toolkits. And on the other hand, the, the ECDL provides functions to load and store images uh, and a specific features also for medical images and different data augmentation techniques and these among the main features. Both, uh, as you can see, are developed here, as you uh, are developed in, in C++ and also uh, we are developing a Python wrapper, so they are easy to use and, and they are accompanied by uh, and to use the use to buy a backend system. It's a RESTful API that allows to, to lower to transform images on the, on the fly and provides the, the functions uh, accessibility to the functions provided by the libraries. And a front end that it's a web graphical interface that allows to uh, access the features provided by the, by the front end. The approach for the distributed computing and deep health is to parallelize the training and inference operations uh, on the HPC infrastructure. And key in our approach is to abstract the parallel execution from the underlying infrastructure and promote a cloudified approach to HPC. So as you can see here, that's why we are uh, adding to the toolkit a specific complements and specific developments. The, the approach for distributed, uh, we have a, a C++ native distribution implementation for the distributed version, but we are also using uh, for distribution frameworks such as COMS or Streamflow by University of Torino, COMS is more, it's more known. Also, we are adapting and optimizing the libraries to different hardware accelerators, namely FPGA, GPUs or many core CPUs. Regarding the adaptation uh, to, to cloud, we are relying on Docker and Kubernetes, and Kubernetes, sorry, and we are creating uh, Docker images for all the components of the, of the toolkit. At this, at this stage, we have already publicly released stable versions of the toolkit. Here you have in the uh, link to the GitHub, I guess the, the slides will be uh, distributed afterwards, will be available. 
And here is a caption of the of the GitHub of the VHEL. And here we can see different PINET repositories with the VL, the ECBL, the, the gripers, uh, the Docker images, but we are in also some use cases pipelines that serve as example, all together with extensive documentation. We are, we are in, uh, right now, uh, most of the features are already implemented and we are now you know, fixing bugs and, and improving the easy installation, which is key to ensure the, uh, the adoption by the, by the industry. Concerning the main second result, uh, it's, it's coupled with the, the DeepHell toolkit and in order to unify, to offer a unifying framework, the DeepHell uh, provides HPC infrastructure support for an efficient execution of, of the libraries. DeepHell uh, HPC architecture varies from traditional HPC infrastructures such as supercomputers. We have, for example, Mare Nostrum from BC. Uh, to heterogeneous clusters with GPU and, F and FPGA-based accelerators until, as I uh, mentioned before, hybrid cloud and HPC com uh, computing infrastructures. A clear focus uh, in, the, in this unified framework we're offering is the usability. And uh, so it's easy to use, it's transparent to the users and promoting the portability. So once you have uh, everything configured, you can really use another, another kind of HPC infrastructure. Uh, in this field, Deep Health is, uh, have two main access, which is provide this uh, common framework and, and then use, use the hardware accelerators. And we are working in three main topics within these two axes. The first one is improving the orchestration of the different uh, uh, distributed and parallel execution of the libraries through uh, improved uh, software architecture of uh, the runtimes and the resource managers. We are also working on optimizing the computing units, including the development of a specific kernels for FPGA and a custom FPGA board adapted to uh, and optimized to, to run the libraries. And finally, we're also working on uh, optimizing the HPC communication for an efficient training. In now at the end of the second year, we have already integrated all different components, uh, software components and the hardware acceleration technologies in this common deep health HPC framework. And Eduardo will be telling a little more about it. So here just wanted to provide a, a, a really a, a glimpse of the, of the framework. And we are also gonna have made advances in the uses of hardware acceleration technologies Oh, uh, the we are now working on this, uh, the building this specific board, uh, which is already designed. Uh, initial kernels are available for running the libraries on FPGAs, and we have also developed the Streamflow uh, framework. But as I said, more more details will come. Uh, finally, uh, concerning the results and to ensure the approach can be easily adopted by the industry and reach our final end users, which are the clinicians and the health researchers. The libraries are being integrated in seven uh, diverse biomedical and software platforms. We have industrial platforms provided by Avery's, Philips, uh, Thales, Wings, and also research platforms provided by UNITO, or University of Torino, CRC4, and SIA. We have both, um, we have platforms that are mostly with, used for inference since their end users are clinicians or physicians. And we have also platforms that can, the, uh, are, that can be used or are used both for training and inference purposes, more oriented to health data scientists and health researchers. And we are integrating the, the libraries in this platform and, and these, will, these platforms and hints will be used for validating the whole approach through 14 different use cases that covers three main areas, neurological diseases, tumor detection and early cancer prediction, and digital pathology and automated annotation. These areas covers uh, technically a wide variety of problems. Uh, they cover classification, segmentation, automatic annotation, so there is a wide variety of it. 
and we will be testing uh, in all of our, our pilots the performance of the toolkit, the performance of the, the libraries used within the platforms, and, and also the efficiency of a wide variety of underlying HPC and cloud resources. We will be testing some use, case, some use cases. We'll use the HPC resources they have on premises. We will also be testing the performance of the libraries on beach HPC infrastructure, such as the Mara Nostrum. And we also will be using some e-read and cloud um, uh, architectures to evaluate. Here you have uh, the, the key performance indicators. So a lot of three main time to uh, indicators, most really related to evaluate the toolkit, to evaluate all the infrastructure support. Uh, we have also the speed up and the efficiency of parallelism and to evaluate if this really serves to health purposes, we have also specific indicators for each of the use cases. Indeed, it's very important to evaluate for us to evaluate if the speed up is not achieved at the expense of not solving the, the health problem. So what we have about so far in this area, all the platforms are already hosting a stable uh, EDDL and ECDL environment. So pilots can start. Uh, also, some of the platforms have been extended their functionalities. So they cope better with uh, the medical application requirements, uh, meaning a specific kind of visualizations or this kind of um, adaptations or in being able to ingest specific medical data, for example. We, uh, we have advanced uh, a lot on the technical testing. So you have seen previously that we have uh, a repository with different uh, use case uh, pipelines that have been used for testing the libraries and then the speed up in, in different uh, infrastructures. And we have already started some of the pilots, but the, the ribbon is not so, it's not as originally planned since in our case, being the project's focus on the health sector, we are being affected by the, by the COVID the, uh, pandemics. Uh, mostly in the use cases where the, um, where data was expected to be collected during the pilots or where data need to be leveled within the project since access to, to health professionals, it's difficult since their priorities are now another one. But we, this is not stopped since some of the use cases were also relying on public data sets. So we are advancing faster with that and reserving some, some resources. So I want to, to add this, uh, this uh, overview of the progress with also rem reminding what, which is the expected impact we, we are expecting, sorry, by the redundancy to achieve at, at the end of the project. Of course, the, the benefits is the, the, um, for the IT experts are quite clear. We, we expect to increase the productivity uh, and also facilitate the daily work. So they, as, as mentioned before, so they have a, just a toolkit that it does, um, they don't need to, to be really, really um, profound experts on all the technologies in order to use it and exploit it. Um, also, since the use cases, we expect to have a great health impact. Uh, because we think we will contribute to improve the, the diagnosis uh, and also the tools created will uh, also be useful to carry on research on images to extend the current knowledge of certain pathologies. And at the end, uh, it should save direct and in, uh, indirect healthcare cost. And all, we are in the pilots, we have specific plan to gather uh, indicators to evaluate really this health impact. And finally, an aspect uh, that I want to highlight is that the impact goes beyond the health sector, since the proposed framework can be applied to other sectors as straightforward. So no the libraries, no the infrastructure support, um, no, not all the platforms are only for the health sector. So, and, and we think that the health uh, results contributes to, to reduce the burden else, to turn AI 
and enabling technology for science, for example, to reduce the complexity, the complexity of numerical methods for, for science. But not only, and this is uh, important also for, for the industry and uh, for companies. You know, for example, I come from a company. Since the deep health and with their tool, with its toolkit, contributes towards offering AI and HPC as a service, which uh, is key for, for rich and sector industries that uh, they don't, uh, that they have only temporary needs for, for HPC, for high computational resources. So we think we are making easy for them to exploit and to use, to, to get closer to the HPC wall. And they can be, and, and all these capabilities can be applied, not just for uh, training predictive models, but for other very uh, computational expensive um, uh, applications. Uh, for example, or graph-based applications, uh, digital twins, uh, whatever. So let's let's see now in the in the last year that the pilots have to really grow and, and start um, coming out with uh, results, clear results if we achieve this impact. So that's everything from my side. I think I was more or less on time. So I'm open to any question. Yeah, thank you. Uh... Monica, for uh, your uh, presentation, there are two. Uh, uh, I got two uh, two questions. One mm -hmm. uh, is uh, from Jean Thomas uh, from uh, uh, Evolve Project. Um, I just read you the the question is uh, during training, which of your resources in terms of FPGAs, GPUs, many cores, uh, uh, and so on and so forth, are the mostly used? Yeah, I think this will be perfectly explained in the, in the next speech. So I prefer, I don't know if Edu, uh, Eduardo is connected can advance or mm, we should wait uh, because... Maybe we can, wish, uh, we can wait uh, uh, the, the technical uh, speech and... Uh, exactly, see. technical speech is focused on how we are leveraging all of this. So uh, uh, Eduardo includes a detail of the different HPC resources that we are contemplating both generally and in the different use cases. So I don't want to spoil. <laughs> Thank you. And the second one comes from uh, Jan Martinovic, uh, Lexis uh, coordinator. Uh, he asks, uh, how are you working with data security according to data management? Yeah, this is a very important question when dealing uh, with health data sets. Uh, we make a, a strong ethics assessment at the beginning so in for the use cases, normally we have pairs between use case provider and, and platforms that are going to, uh, to implement or that it's going to be used in this use case. So right now we are following different kind of um, agreements in order to access this, this data. This is the way we are working between the pairs of use cases and, and platforms. In other cases, uh, it was impossible due to internal policies of the of the uh, hospital or the use case provider, or the, the the data cannot go out of the premises. So we are installing the platform in the premises. So we ensure data does not get out of there. This is the case for some platforms that are oriented to the physicians. For example, the Philips platform. It's been installed on premises to to avoid this problem. And in other cases, uh, we are using a public data set, so we are not uh, affected by the, the, the privacy issues. But also we are exploiting more experimentally some uh, techniques on, on split learning, which is a, a technique similar to feathered learning, quite different, but that distributes the training process so uh, only some weights are transferred to the to the platform in order to to avoid the need to transfer images. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, uh, Monica. I think that we can, we are um, quite good in our timing. 
Um, I will ask uh, Eduardo if uh, he can uh, uh, join, uh, or join us on uh, the, the virtual stage uh, and present uh, uh, the, the technical part for uh, details. Thank you, thank you all. Let me know um, when you can see the slides. Uh, Eduardo, I think uh, the, we can hear you very, very, very far away from the, the mic. You can hear me very far away. Yeah. Uh, this is the first time happened to me in uh in zoom uh let no, me no, double a little bit better now better yeah okay i will try to speak loud then if at some point you lost me just stop me okay and i will yeah. i will increase the the level of my voice okay so uh thank you first of all as uh, monica has said before thank you for uh inviting us to this workshop. Um, so what I'm going to present today uh, is um, the, the infrastructure, what we call the Deep Health HPC infrastructure that we have created in order to allow uh, the different deep learning operation to be executed in an heterogeneous computing environment. So. What I'm going to present today is the collaborative uh, activities of, of a set of partners that are uh, listed here. Um, so let me start with the with um, motivation. Um, so in the project, we are targeting uh, a large number of different computing infrastructures. So here I'm just listing some of them. Uh, so, for example, we are uh, planning to use the Mare Nostrum super computer that, it's, that includes both CPU and GPU resources. We are also going to use uh, uh, a cloud a GPU based, based resource available at UNITO at the University of Torino. We are also planning to experiment with, uh, with a prototype uh, composed of FPGAs uh, in order to, to evaluate the behavior of FPGAs in uh, deep health, sorry, in uh, deep learning. And also we want to have access to public cloud. Um, so rather than providing a solution, a dedicated solution for each of these uh, computing resources that each of those uh, is accessed in a different way, uh, the strategy that we are uh, following in the project is providing a, a single uh, a single solution, a single platform that can abstract all the all the complexities and provide to the to the to the EDDL and the ECVL a single uh, access, a single point access. Um, so. Um, one, as Monica has um, already said, um, the, one of the two main objective of, uh, of, of the project is on one side, the development of, of these two libraries, the European Computer Vision and the European Distributed Deep Learning libraries that will allow to include, to extend the functionalities of a set of software medical uh, platforms by providing uh, deep learning technologies and a software platform that uh, that can exploit all the performance capabilities of the different computing infrastructures okay, that we are planning to experiment. 
So we can execute the set of uh, use cases that uh, Monica has already presented efficiently into those uh, platforms. And so the objective of my, of my talk is to talk about this one. Um, and so here in this platform, we are exploiting it we are exploiting heterogeneity uh, across two different levels. So the first level is we want to speed up uh, the execution of the training operations. And to, and to do this, we are distributing uh, the execution of a training across uh, multiple heterogeneous computing nodes. So there can be most uh, nodes compute, uh, composed of EPUs, nodes composed of uh, CPUs plus GPUs plus FPGAs, or even a, a nodes that are accessed through cloud technologies that includes uh, EPUs. So uh, the first level we want to, ex to exploit is how we distribute this uh, in this case, this uh, synchronous uh, distribution uh, training operation into this environment. The second level is once we are within a node, how we can take benefit of the backward and forward operations of the EDDL or the data augmentation of operations of the ECVL so it can take benefit of the acceleration fee features that this node includes. At the end, what we are trying to solve is how do we map all this computation into an heterogeneous environment? This is at the end what the Deep Health HPC infrastructure tries to address. Um, and so this is how the, from a, from a high level, perspective, this is how the, the Deep Health HPC infrastructure looks like. Um, as, as I said before, the objective of this infrastructure is to exploit all the performance capabilities in a unified way. So we don't want to the EDDL and the ECVL, these two libraries that will be included into the medical software tools, we don't want them to be aware about the underlying so uh, about the underlying infrastructure but to be as abstract as possible and of course we want to increase the productivity when uh, when um, in, in order to efficiently exploit uh, the different uh, deep learning op operations and, and and data augmentation operations and what I would like to do now is to present how each of the different components that are included in the in the deep learn in, in the deep health HPC infrastructure, how the different components contribute to these two uh, objectives. So uh, the first component uh, I would like to present uh, you is the is is the com is is a distributed a task base aimword that is named name uh, comms that has been uh, developed at bsc for quite uh, a, a large amount of time um uh so it's so it's so it's, so it's a very stable solution uh, and, and and this is used for uh distribute the training operations of the eddl and so and so speed up them the uh, in the comms in in the to, in the comms task base framework, work uh, programmers expose the parallelism um, um, within the sequential source code uh, by defining uh, tasks that are the unit of parallelism that the, then the runtime manages as well as describing the data dependencies among them. Uh, the programmer does not need to know any, um, does need to have any knowledge about the underlying infrastructure. All this is hidden. And so it is the runtime, the one responsible of managing how the different tasks are allocated 
to the different computing e-sources. So in this very simple example, uh, so here we are having um, uh, two functions and one of these functions and these two functions can be executed potentially in parallel as far as uh, the, the synchronization dependencies among, among these different uh, functions are fulfilled. So with this, uh, pro this programming uh, model is the one we are used to implement both synchronous and asynchronous uh, training operations. So for example, in the, in the, in the, in the example you are, uh, we are showing here, uh, this is the implementation of a synchronous operation in which at each epoch all the all all the all the train bytes are uh, synchronized then weights are aggregated and the new weights are sent back to to the to uh to the different nodes to train over the different batches uh, so what the comms uh, runtime does is to create this map, this allocation automatically. This, al this allocation is not static, it's is an, is an, is dynamically done. So it is depending on the resources available and, and different strategies, different uh, scheduling uh, strategies, the runtime will design in which computing node is the most appropriate to execute uh, the different train batch operations. Uh, something that the, that, uh, the runtime also provides is the split and distribution of a data set. So in this case, we are going to split a, a data set into three batches and uh, it also provides a shuffling operations, including global shuffling, which means that at, at each epoch, the whole data set is going to be shuffled, selective shuffling. So only a portion of, only a portion of the data set is going to be shuffled, minimizing the communication uh, requirements and local shuffling. Uh, this is also pro pro provided by this also pro provided by the comms uh, infrastructure. Uh, the second important component um, it's the uh, it's the stream flow um, component that is that is used to manage when more than when more than one uh, training op operation is being executed into the platform. Streamflow, uh, which is uh, that has been uh, developed by by the University of um, of Orino, is the component in charge of managing the deployment and the execution of, uh, of the different training operations into the platform. Uh, this is uh, a uh, stream flow uh, provides a declarative description of the different workflows you want to, ex you want to execute, including both a workflow description and um, a model description. So once we have once we have uh, distributed uh, uh, once we have distributed the different um, um, uh, training operations with comms and we have deployed this with uh, with with streamflow. The next uh, component uh, we, we have included is supporting hybrid cloud. Hybrid clouds, uh, it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's an important component uh, because this allows those uh, institutions with limited computing uh, resources to temporarily uh, allocate computation on, on, on public clouds without requiring of changing anything of its infrastructure. So uh, the, the the, the training operations can be distributed to the HPC cloud, to the H, to its HPC infrastructure, to their private cloud infrastructure, and eventually to the public cloud infrastructure when this is needed. In order uh, to, to do this, uh, 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 a hybrid cloud technologies has been 
created by the uh, partner Illogic uh, e Technologies. And what they provide is an API, a RESTful API, uh, in order to simplify the, 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 the deployment and the management on both the private cloud and the public cloud. This API has been included in the runtime of comms, so the programmer does not need the, the so not, not the programmer, the, uh, the EDDL library does not need to take uh, into account all the complexities of, uh, of managing, of, orchest of orchestrating the computation between the, pri the private and the public cloud. And moreover, other components such as uh, Ensure and uh, VPN capabilities has been included in order to provide uh, a secure com communication uh, between uh, the different Kubernetes clusters. Um, so, um, so, so, so far uh, we have been uh, describing what has been uh, the different uh, components, the different software components that we are uh, using in order to distribute uh, the backward and forward operations of a, of, 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 of a training operation across an heterogeneous uh, computing node. But something uh, we also want to to exploit it's once you are within a given node, how how you can exploit the uh, accelerate the accelerator devices included in this node, and to do this, what we have done is we have include uh, or we are supporting different programming models. So in case of uh, CPUs, we are supporting OpenMP. In case of CUDA, uh, we are uh, in case of NVIDIA's G. EPUs, we are supporting CUDA. And in case of FPGAs, we are supporting OpenCL. So we can either map this execution, the, 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 the inference uh, of, of a given, um, of a given um, a deep neural network to be executed into an FPGA, into an EPU, or splitting the uh, execution and there is a the, there is a portion of the inference that is, is executed on the FPGA and there is a portion of the executing that is being executed on this EPU or the whole execution is executed both on, on the G, on the CPU or on the FPGA. Um, the FPGA at technology is quite new and one thing we want to 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 and in the and in the deep health project we want to explore it we want to see up to which level we can take benefit of the fpga technology and because of this uh, something uh, one of the activities we are we are doing into into the into the deep health project is to give is to develop and optimize FPGA in order to improve the inference operation. And the way we are doing this is by uh, including into the FPGA not only access to the to the uh, DDR4 memory, but also provide H, but also provide HBM memory in order to uh, to, to have a, a, a fast access to the to uh, weights and to a data set. Um, and then, of course, something we want is to try to identify what are what are the use cases uh, that fits better with the different acceleration features. So we want to check if 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 there are medical use cases that can take more benefit of one acceleration technology than other acceleration technology. And because of this, we have selected all those data sets that are 
publicly available so we can have access to it and 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 and, and we are experimenting with them with different accelerators each so 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 this is the current status how we are uh, experimenting with how we are exper experimenting with uh, with 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 them and so uh, to conclude my answer to conclude um, um, the, the 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 objective of what we call the deep health infrastructure is to enable the two libraries that have been developed uh, within uh, within a project that is the EDDL and the ECDL library so it can exploit the different performance uh, capabilities uh, um, of all the HPC uh, uh, um, and uh, HPC and cloud computing infrastructures that we are providing within the within within uh, within the project and to do this I've presented four main components um, that is a task based a task based model in order to describe the parallelism of the training operations, uh, a workflow orchestrator in order to manage um, uh, the situation in which more than one training operation is being executed. Uh, also, um, an, an hybrid cloud solution in order to, uh, to effectively, effectively combine public and public cloud uh, resources into a, into a, into a unique uh, solution. So if, a, if, if an institution eventually re requires more computing power, it can go to a public cloud resources. In this case, we are only are addressing uh, Am Amazon Web Services. And in order to, to take benefit, uh, to, to maximize the performance capabilities of the underlying platforms, um, our infrastructure supports OpenCL, uh, OpenMP, and CUDA, and we are also exploiting uh, the use of uh, FPGAs technologies in order to optimize inference operation. And that's all from my side. And I'm glad to, uh, if you have any question, I know you have at least one, but if there are more, more yeah, questions. Yeah, uh, thank you, Eduardo. Yeah, there are two, basically two questions from uh, Christos. Um, I can read it, um, read them. Uh, uh, the first one uh, is related to slide five. Uh, and uh, um, Christos asks, uh, uh, is the aggregate uh, weights module triggered at the end of the processing of each batch or does it allow multiple batches to run uh, before uh, aggregating the weights? This depends if you are implementing a synchronous approach or an asynchronous approach. So in this, in this example, it is synchronous, which means you do not allow. So uh, all batches uh, must be synchronized at the end of the epoch. However, as I described briefly here we are also we have we are, have also implemented asynchronous training operations which means um, you allow uh, batches to continue the execution without waiting so in this case you are incrementally aggregating of a different weights as 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 the batches finishes this of course has the problem that that uh, that that the training cannot be uh, and that you do not necessarily need to achieve the same accuracy although you are you are speeding up uh, the, the 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 training process because this course grade synchronization barrier is uh, removed. Uh, okay, the second part for, from the same question. Uh, what ranges of batch size uh, does your platform uh, support? Uh, uh, can you repeat again? Because I because the connection was cut for just a few seconds. What what ranges? Uh, yeah, what ranges of batch sizes uh, does your platform support? Uh, 
this is a configurable parameter. So depending of how many uh, resources do you have, you can, you can, you can, I mean, you can split the data set uh, as much as uh, you like. So this is more depending of on the platform you are addressing, as well as as well as what type of uh, shuffling strategy you are implementing. So if you want to, depending if you want to implement local, global, or el elective. Okay, uh, and there is the last question that is related to how, which are basically the, the features, uh, or if you have some insights uh, uh, the drive drive you uh, to use one technology uh, rather than uh, the other ones. So, mm -hmm. how do you select uh, GAs instead okay. of GPUs? Okay, so here it is well it is well known uh, that for training, uh, GPUs are the best solution. Um, that is starting to be a research line on how FPGA and how FPGAs can accelerate in training. Still, FPGAs are not as good as EPUs uh, for training. Um, one, of the one of the reasons is because uh, there are very few uh, FPGAs with H with, with, a with HBM memory. Uh, for inference, uh, uh, FPGAs uh, uh, wins EPUs, okay. However, um, I've been, uh, I mean, I've been talking quite a lot on training operations, but the training operations, in, in the training operations, you may include data, or you may need to, 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 uh, to, uh, to apply data augmentation, okay? And they, these kernels can be efficiently executed with FPGAs. So FPGAs do, are, not on, are not only used or cannot only be used for, um, for uh, uh, training operations, but also for data augmentation operations. And in this case, FPGAs can be a very good solution. In any case, uh, our, the objective of our platform is that we want to be able to use any type of infra of platform. So the user, the programmer, can easily program using uh, FPGAs rather than, C than GPUs because of an energy reason, for example. FPGAs are better than GPUs from an energy pers perspective. So in case there is the need of providing a very energy efficient solution, regardless of the time, our infrastructure will be able to use SFPGAs instead of using EPUs. Okay. Thank you uh, again, uh, Eduardo, for uh, your uh your uh, presentation and uh, for answering uh, questions. Um, I think it's uh, it's time for the next uh, next uh, uh, coffee break. So um, we can uh, join again uh, in uh, 30 minutes. Um, so enjoy the, the, the break. You can see my presentation. Uh, so again, thank you for inviting us to this uh, this workshop on heterogeneous and low power data center technologies. Um, I'm going to give a, an, an overview and a status update from the Cybel project. So the Cybel project would have been funded as well uh, alongside some of the other projects we've heard about today. Um, so just some, some kind of key facts about the project. Um, it was funded under ICT 11. Uh, there's 31 partners involved spread across 14 countries. There's a 14 million euro uh, budget for the project. Um, there's, as part of the project, we have nine demonstrators, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about those demonstrators in, in a couple of minutes. Um, but primarily, the project is looking at HPC, big data, 
AI, IoT, and crucially for our project that kind of differentiates it quite a lot is it also looks at precision livestock farming and precision agriculture. So one of the main motivations behind the project, what we're really trying to have an impact on is food waste. Um, food waste uh, you know, has a massive social and economic uh, consequences, um, not just environmentally, but all, also financially right across you know, the, the full gamble of, of the food chain. One of the very surprising facts about food waste is that, you know, one third of the food that's produced today, that's produced right across the world, ends up in a landfill. Um, and the, the European Commission are, are very interested in seeing what kind of technologies can be used, particularly in the precision livestock, precision agriculture space, can be used to help producers uh, reduce food waste so in, in a lot of different ways and in particular the Sabel project is looking at this food waste crisis from, from, from a perspective of how can we help food growers and food producers to be um, more efficient um, in their production to produce higher quality foods and um, to also produce foods that would have, have a longer shelf life and um, potentially diversify some of the food crops that, that they're, they're making. And we're doing this through uh, leveraging high performance computing, big data, AI, those technologies. Um, if you think about you know, the future of, of agriculture, it's, it's, it's going through quite a substantial digital transformation at the moment. Um, and agri-tech as a, as a concept, it has been exploding over the last few years. And um, we've seen lots and lots of different technologies coming out in, in this space. Um, and the promise is really to see what can be done using technology on, on all aspects of um, agriculture. And that's, this is really where ag tech is coming from. Um, there's a huge amount of technology being put into the market now, but not all of them necessarily are leveraging the technologies like HPC and uh, other artificial intelligence technologies. Uh, so like a typical farm uh, of the future, we'd say it's going to have lots of these kind of key uh, technologies on the farm. So potentially drone technology that, that's doing uh, kind of low observations of the crops to um, high bandwidth connectivity into farms. So you're able to get access to, to data. So um, farm managers can make, you know, really, really cr crucial decisions while they're on the farm in, in the field. Um, but really what's driving a lot of this technology and a lot of this decision making is artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence, one of the really key enablers for artificial intelligence is high performance computing. So that's computing that's able to process really, really high volumes of data um, and able to do it really quickly um, and, and to do it in such a way that it's accessible from the cloud or from edge devices in, in compressed models. Um, but one of, the, one of the major issues that, that is kind of hindering unlocking this, this real value in, in precision agriculture is just the fact that HPC systems, at the moment, they're, they're to the vast majority, even to, to, of data scientists, they're quite inaccessible systems. It's more kind of specialized uh, scientific areas that are doing kind of large scale science, uh, scientific experiments. That's really where HPC is, is accessible. So HPCs are kind of suffering this hurdle of usability that needs to be overcome if we really want to unlock the potential of HPC. And why is HPC uh, not so, so accessible? Uh, primarily, it's, it, it's kind of the lack of expertise in the area, lack of big data and data mining expertise, lack of artificial intelligence, machine learning, model building expertise, uh, the difficulty to access IoT sensor data uh, for processing, and uh, the lack of expertise in writing HPC capable and, and HPC optimized algorithms and processes. Uh, so if you look at like a typical agri-tech company that might be innovating in the space, um, they may not have the expertise of HPC at hand, you know, or, or, or they may be just a small company that's, um, you know, helping, uh, working with farmers directly. They would need a lot of uh, expertise or, or assistance in being able to get into HPC environments. So 
you know, what, what we see is a future where precision agriculture, pre precision livestock farming can be unlocked. It's the, the full potential of those systems can be unlocked uh, through the Cybel platform. And what's this going to give them? It's going to give them data at their fingertips. It's going to give, you know, up to the date, accurate and kind of customized weather predictions. It's going to give them kind of environmental information, potentially coming from satellite imagery, soil temperature, sea conditions, UV factors. Uh, it's going to help them make much more informed decisions. So if they're looking at their crops and they're looking at their yield, they can actually classify their crops into, into different kind of high performing and lower performing crops. Potentially they could differentiate their products that way. They could look at, you know, coming up with more detailed fertilization plans for their, for their crops. And if you're looking at livestock farming as well, we could look at um, systems that's able to give the farmers or the farm managers much more accurate information or live information even on the weight of their pigs or the weight of their livestock. So they, they can actually fill orders um, for, to, for meat producers much more uh, readily. Um, also looking at potentially movement patterns of these animals would be a good indicator of their, their health and their well-being. And if they're able to make more informed decisions, what we're hoping is that there'd be more improved outcomes and improved outcomes from a food waste perspective. So better, higher quality food, longer shelf life, higher yield. Uh, they're able to differentiate their products to so enter new markets and ultimately have an impact on, on less food waste. So you can see how, how this is our, our vision of how, you know, accessing and, and making HPC much more accessible can have a, a, a real impact on food waste through precision agriculture. So in, in specific details, uh, what is the Cybel project uh, offering? So this is kind of from, from, from a high, level, high enough level. Uh, we're offering HPC abstractions. So this is making um, act the actual development and programming of HPC algorithms easier through the use of these HPC abstractions. So for example, you could run, you could develop a, an algorithm in Python and you could have it run on a various number of HPC systems where each of those HPCs could have different uh, architectures or different resource managers. So you don't need to know exactly under the hood how to access those HPC systems. So we're abstracting that. And uh, that's gonna allow these kind of, uh, you know, agri food uh, innovators to get their products uh, to the market faster, especially if it's, if it's leveraging HPC. Uh, we're going to be providing AI and, and machine learning templates so they can take a, a machine learning algorithm off the shelf and have it very easily customized for their data and, and their outputs. And all, we're also looking at intelligent query builders. So that's looking at complex sources of data. How can you, you know, bring different types of sources of data together and visualize it in a way that would benefit the decision makers in, in those industries? So that's just some of the key innovations that are coming out of the project. We have a lot more. Uh, looking at the, the, the pilots of the project in particular, um, precision agriculture, we're looking at uh, organic soya yield and, and protein prediction. Uh, we're also looking uh, in detail at kind of food safety uh, along the, you know, the, the food pipeline. So looking at food recall scenarios. Um, we're looking at robotic systems for arable, so that's essentially having uh, dr drone imagery to be able to scan a field and be able to, you know, estimate how much wheat corn would be available in, in the field, uh, and that would also, you know, feed into yield crop uh, forecasting. In precision livestock farming, we're looking at this pig, pig weighing optimization, and also looking at, uh, or, or, or trying to trying to identify. Um, meat quality from pig production. Um, we're also assisting in open sea fishing. So this is giving advice to, to fishers that are fishermen are actually out in the sea so they can best plan their route. And uh, again, the data feeding in from that is from satellite imagery. Uh, we're looking at herd movement and herd health, and then also aquaculture monitoring and, and feeding optimization. And that's in the area of uh, Mediterranean fish farms. So those aspects in, in precision agriculture, precision livestock farming, uh, they're quite diverse enough sets of, of demonstrators, uh, but that really helps us because we have to build a system then that's able to meet all of these guys' requirements. And eventually into the future, we can bring in more uh, precision agriculture, precision livestock farming use cases and to show them how uh, these HPC systems can, can be used. 
Um, but just to give you an example, um, I'm just going to speak a little bit about um, how we're helping the pig farmers. So in a, in a pig, typical pig farm, you might have up to five or 600 pigs um, and you might have, you know, four or five um, manual uh, workers that are working at the farm and you'll have a farm manager. So it's a lot of animals for them to manage. Um, and in, in, in not all situations can they keep an eye on the pig's well-being, can they you know, keep an eye on pig's behavior, potentially if, if some of the pigs are, are fighting each other or if some of the pigs aren't well. Um, it's quite difficult for them to keep an eye on the pigs all of the time. Uh, and also it's, it's a laborious kind of a task to be able to weigh and, and to try and understand what are the weight of the pigs in the pig pen. Uh, so in the project we're developing a uh, machine learning driven uh, solution where uh, a camera is uh, positioned above the pig pen and it's able to analyze the activity of what's going on in a pig pen. So potentially you could have six or seven animals in each individual pig pen. And it's able to you know, count those pigs look at their the behavior, look at their movement patterns, and also just from the, the imagery to, to calculate what's the average weight of the pigs in this pig pen, and potentially what's the average weight or what's the weight of individual pigs in the pig pen. Uh, and that information, again, could be used to inform pig farmers which pig pens are, are ready to go uh, to the next stage in the, in the, in the meat production line. Um, so where does HPC come into this? So, Training the, the, these cameras to be able to identify these behaviours, you need a lot of data uh, that's potentially collected from live farms, the data is annotated, and then these models need to be trained and customised and built. Um, and this training of the models would be done in HPC's environment, so it would dramatically cut down the duration that it takes to, to come up with an optimal model. And then when these models are, are trained, they can be de deployed in production. And potentially it, the, that, that training cycle could be uh, iterative and it could be updated periodically, or it could be customized on a per farm basis. But HPC we see in, in that scenario, um, it definitely adds a, a huge amount of value, but it's, it, it would be an activity that would be very difficult for you know, innovative farm managers to be able to take on themselves. They would need a lot of extra support and skills. Um, so from, from, a, from a project perspective, you know, we're quite uh, developed into the project and, and we'll hear next from Sophia about some of, some of the key innovations and developments that have been happening in the, in the project so far. Um, we're actually in, in month 24, probably similar to some of the other uh, projects presented here today. Uh, we had our um, midterm review back in September uh, where the results were very, very positive. Um, again, I guess one of the key things emphasised at the mid-review was that uh, the project is going quite well, but the, the second half we really need to deliver on the promises. Uh, so this, its full um, focus is on how we're assisting and, uh, and uh, you know, leveraging the technologies developed in the first part of the project to assist these nine demonstrators. Um, and how do we measure the value to each of those demonstrators from, from a you know, environmental product, production perspective, but also commercial uh, value as well. And we're already seeing some commercial value in some of the models that we've built uh, in some of the demonstrators. So that's really, really excellent progress. Um, we're hoping that the platform will be available uh, to, to members, you know, outside the consortium before the end of the year. So before we complete the project, we'll be releasing uh, components of, of the Cybell platform that we, we can be leveraged and potentially deployed by uh, other, you know, members of, of the agri precision agri-tech community outside of just the nine demonstrators that we have here. Uh, so thanks for taking the time to, um, to, to hear about the Cybell project, um, our motivations and our, our um, aspirations and, and some of the updates that we have. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to, to take them. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, appreciate for the interesting uh, uh, view you give us uh, from uh, these two, uh, at least in my opinion, two very two distant worlds. Uh, farming, agriculture, and uh, ICT digital uh, technology world. Um, I would uh, uh, leave the stage uh, just right now to, to Sophia so that um, we, we can have the 
also the second uh, uh, table uh, presentation for for uh, uh, from the Cybel uh, project. So uh, later we have uh, hope, hopefully uh, still time for uh, questions and uh, maybe just a sh very short round table with uh, um, uh, project coordinators just to uh, to understand the next steps, uh, ideas for to to share uh, experiences, uh, and so on. So um, please, Sofia, the stage is yours. Thanks, Alberto. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you for having us uh, uh, all gathered uh, today, sharing all these uh, uh, novel concepts. Um, from the perspective of uh, the technical challenges that Sibele uh, is uh, facing and was. Uh, the main uh, uh, issues and the motivations uh, um, actually activating the, our uh, technical work is uh, the large volumes of uh, data that are requiring uh, diverse and online computing uh, capabilities uh, for different modalities, including uh, the collection, the analysis, the processing, the transformation into um, data that can be easily processed. Uh, upon data analysis, so then complex and uh, dynamic uh, workflows uh, require uh, intelligent mechanisms for uh, transformation, aggregation, and training, pressing for convergence of uh, big data and uh, HPC worlds. Uh, big data uh, is bringing um, tasks for uh, um, uh, distributed uh, tasks, while HPC introduces uh, tasks for parallel computing. Um, when data are loaded and uh, stored at uh, the test pits, then they require uh, efficient mechanisms uh, for um, a collection of uh, data services for curation, anonymization, enrichment, uh, semantic alignment, and uh, um, very specific data-related uh, tasks. Uh, and uh, then, uh, after the voluminous uh, analysis of uh, the results, um, all these require adaptable and uh, non-blocking visualization services. As directly um, um, this demand is uh, coming from uh, the industrial uh, demonstrators, um, they need, after this uh, time-consuming analysis or training, uh, to produce report, to visualize uh, the, uh, the, the results, uh, to produce uh, the different charts or means of uh, uh, exposing um, um, the result of uh, uh, their computation. The Sibele main proposition is to uh, innovate, design solutions, integrate and boost interoperability for advanced decision making in uh, precision architecture and uh, precision livestock uh, farming through efficient and optimized big data and uh, HPC uh, infrastructure that uh, I will present later on uh, some details on the test that we have uh, set up. Um, in the support of uh, voluminous data operations, parallel and di distributed computing tasks, the key enablers and uh, the services or parts of the components that are currently offered um, are the data services layer and the secure data operations, the hybrid big data and HPC capabilities through the parallel and distributed management layer, the embedded experiment composition layer uh, directly delivered to the stakeholders and the end users, uh, which empowers them to set up uh, their own analytic uh, pipelines, and uh, the visualization and the reporting layer to uh, expose, disseminate uh, the results and uh, visualize the, the results of their analysis. Our core uh, motivation uh, is also to understand the users. We are um, very closely work with the users, the nine uh, demonstration sites, um, either having direct requirements for applications, um, part of uh, their commercial activities or simulations, uh, because in many cases, um, uh, simulations are uh, uh, very time uh, demanding and uh, require from them uh, um, uh, some days to be performed. The challenges uh, we are facing is the efficient management and aggregation of uh, the multitude of satellite imagery, time series and uh, textual data for the creation of 
um, data are not only by means of uh, categorical or numerical data, but uh, external sources are also used uh, uh, for weather, for um, uh, food recalls, uh, exploiting and mining uh, text, um, uh, resulting in a more complex analysis operations. Uh, other challenges include the limited resources to benchmark the developed algorithms or existing algorithms uh, in MATLAB, in uh, scripts, in uh, technologies um, that currently require more intensive and um, uh, more velocity in uh, processing and to the time consuming simulations and uh, the AI models training. Uh, requiring uh, uh, days or weeks uh, to be performed or uh, finalized. The envision outcomes uh, uh, within the Sibele team is, uh, the, are the advanced uh, big data and uh, HPC infrastructure capabilities to efficiently process the data and execute these algorithms. Translate all these algorithms from uh, um, the code bases the demonstrator partners are bringing into distributed or parallel um, uh, uh, multi-threaded uh, uh, tasks directly at uh, uh, big data or uh, HPC partitions. Uh, the optimized and secure data services and algorithms for distributed and parallel execution and the semi or automatic analytic application and simulations uh, along with uh, capabilities for to easily configure, uh, allocate resources and execute end-to-end um, uh, -end analytic pipelines in hybrid big data and HPC ecosystems. Uh, in a nutshell, the Sibele concept uh, includes uh, uh, solutions directly at uh, uh, precision architecture, uh, agriculture and precision livestock farming. Uh, but uh, uh, we are converging uh, um, uh, partners with uh, diverse uh, experiences, including HPC big data uh, and uh, AI um, technology background. Um, and uh, currently uh, we are um, in uh, uh, the position of delivering the, the, the first integrated uh, prototype of Sibeli uh, incorporating uh, data navigation and exploration services, uh, experiment composition services uh, to strengthen the end users directly uh, dictate and orchestrate their own applications, advanced analytics, academic partners are uh, uh, closely working with um, uh, the demonstrator partners um, to, to produce distributed and parallel algorithms for, for their ana analytics adaptive visualizations and uh, a collection of uh, resource abstractions and uh, uh, execution uh, loaders to couple uh, the both worlds of uh, big data and uh, HPC uh, in a seamless uh, way, uh, as Steve um, uh, mentioned previ previously, in a manner that the end user um, will not uh, should not take into consideration what are uh, the exposed resources underneath? Uh, so uh, abstracted um, uh, resources are exposed to the end users without the need to take into consideration the specificities and the complexities um, in the underlying infrastructure. Uh, uh, we, we are developing a lot of uh, technologies which are uh, of, of good maturity and they are also progressing within the frame of uh, the project. Uh, and I will present later on some uh, um, details about the demonstrators. The Sibele offerings actually are targeting different uh, users. Of course, uh, uh, in the foreground, uh, uh, there are the agri-food IT industry uh, stakeholders, uh, which um, are serving as uh, uh, the proxy between um, uh, the direct deployments and um, uh, the technology providers, big data and HPC infrastructure owners, researchers in uh, big data analytics, HPC and agri-domain, data scientists, business analysts, and agri-food uh, professional uh, uh, bringing the direct requirements and the need uh, from the fields of um, uh, application. 
Uh, this is uh, um, a, a figure about um, how the solution of Sibel is offered uh, to the different uh, uh, users. Uh, I will not go into uh, many details. Uh, I would only need to uh, draw uh, um, some core elements here, which are the parallel and distributed execution management layer. This is the layer which abstracts big data and HPC resources to the end users without the need uh, to know many technical uh, details. Uh, the data services layer, which uh, takes care of uh, all these uh, uh, data check-in, data cleaning, curation, and uh, semantic alignment, anonymization, and uh, data exploration services. As part of uh, this layer, uh, uh, the advanced query builder uh, directly enables end users to um, combine operators, um, complex operators over distributed storage and perform queries which can further uh, serve for reporting or visualization uh, purposes. Uh, the embedded experiment composition layer, which incorporates uh, uh, the experiment builder, which is uh, an automatic tool uh, uh, delivered to end users, uh, which uh, facilitates them to build uh, their own uh, analytic applications, and the collection of um, uh, machine learning and deep learning models directly coupled with um, uh, the demonstrator needs and uh, the requirements actually to distribute and parallelize uh, their daily tasks, either coming from um, uh, some simulation uh, um, requirements or uh, uh, training um, AI models. And overall, uh, uh, all these uh, um, components and services being uh, integrated uh, are lying on top of uh, distributed uh, uh, storage, while um, uh, secure access is being granted uh, through uh, novel mechanisms for granting uh, authentication and authorization uh, to the end users, um, which enables um, uh, a secure data infrastructure. Um, in the convergence of all these worlds, uh, uh, the HPC, big data, and uh, AI coexist in uh, Sibel um, at uh, several cases. Uh, for instance, uh, we are having five precision agriculture uh, demonstrators. Um, I'm uh, only um, concretizing uh, the need and the solution brought directly by the HPC and uh, the big data. Uh, this also involves the translation of uh, where we were and uh, um, uh, where we are or will be in the upcoming period, uh, onboarding these new technologies in their field. For instance, in um, uh, uh, demo one, which is uh, about um, organic soya yield uh, um, uh, prediction, uh, we are focusing on parallelization and uh, the speed up of their um, uh, uh, training, uh, AI training tasks. Um, uh, demo two um, deals with uh, food safety, uh, food recall, and uh, um, a commercialized um, uh, component uh, which uh, daily monitors uh, the recalls of the food uh, and produces um, reports uh, to the end users, uh, incorporating text mining and distributed uh, uh, data collection uh, within uh, its pipeline. Um, in demo three, the uh, uh, optimization of organic fruit production uh, also includes the parallelization over the HPC partition, um, as well as in uh, demo four and uh, demo five. Moving in um, uh, precision livestock uh, farming um, and uh, in the direction of uh, peak weighing uh, optimization and uh, uh, sustainable production. Um, multi nodes, multi GPUs uh, are being deployed by combining uh, PyTorch and uh, MPI uh, with uh, direct requirements to speed up and uh, uh, increase the processing uh, speed of. Uh, of the training uh, tasks. Uh, 
Um, either other demos uh, such as uh, uh, open sea fishing and aquaculture uh, monitoring uh, are focusing on uh, distributed processing, including uh, Spark and uh, uh, big data um, processing tasks, while others in the hyperparameter tuning in order to have more robust and more accurate uh, uh, models uh, for uh, optimizing uh, the, the feed of uh, uh, the fishes. Uh, Sibele as a whole uh, actually collects uh, data of uh, huge volumes from uh, geographically distributed uh, locations, uh, um, uh, offers added value services for food safety um, uh, and uh, optimization tasks, including um, and exploiting distributed deep learning algorithms. Um, uh, needs coming directly from uh, the industry for global and uh, local learning, preserving uh, privacy, preserving security, uh, and uh, at the same time contributing in uh, advanced uh, decision making. And the requirements for uh, 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 speeding up uh, uh, daily trainings or uh, simulations, uh, complex simulations or other time demanding uh, tasks um, facilitating uh, their daily activity as analysts or uh, as software engineers. Uh, the solutions of Sibel uh, to these uh, uh, challenges include the uh, seamless HPC resources management, offering uh, abstracted capabilities to the end users without the need uh, to have a specific background uh, either in HPC or uh, big data uh, programming. Uh, HBC Big Data and AI collocation exploiting uh, different resource managers, which are combined uh, with uh, the Kubernetes um, Big Data Resource Manager. A resource abstraction layer, which serves as, as the middleware, which uh, uh, exposes uh, resources to the end users and, and leverages and, and efficiently orchestrates both HPC and big data partitions uh, automatically, and the experiment composition uh, environment, which uh, abstracts and facilitates uh, the end user to set up uh, their own analytic applications and perform more, more advanced analytics, uh, uh, also including uh, deep learning um, frameworks or machine learning frameworks uh, within their processing tasks. Uh, in a nutshell, the, the status of uh, the testbeds which have been currently uh, uh, deployed and um, um, uh, before Christmas uh, was uh, uh, HLRS and uh, P uh, uh, PSNC having uh, diverse uh, workload managers, however exposed in a seamless way to the end users. Um, uh, this uh, um, uh, are uh, testbeds which uh, are more mature, mature uh, currently having uh, uh, many cores, um, uh, huge uh, uh, volumes of uh, disks and uh, um, uh, either GPUs or uh, without uh, GPUs capabilities. While um, uh, after Christmas, uh, uh, um, uh, new testbeds have been also onboarded and are getting mature, also onboarding more services and uh, components uh, uh, there, including uh, Bull and uh, Sineca, which um, uh, in the upcoming periods are expected uh, uh, um, uh, uh, to, to be increased and on board uh, more resources uh, and uh, test uh, more experiments there. Part of uh, the work performed, um, or of course, uh, can be found in more details and uh, has been uh, published in uh, related uh, um, venues, so in, um, in case uh, more technical details are needed, uh, have been disseminated, I, I can also uh, answer. Uh, the highlights and the key takeaways of uh, Sibel, uh, now you can see a screenshot of the integrated uh, Sibel uh, platform, uh, as uh, can be triggered by external uh, users. So uh, the home tab uh, 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 presents high level information about um, uh, um, the activity in, within the project. The composer tab uh, uh, gives uh, direct um, accessibility 
to the environment uh, which uh, set up uh, the experiments, the analytic pipelines um, uh, and uh, can be easily used by the end uh, users by means of directed acyclic graphs orchestrating microservices underneath. Uh, the query builder where the user can um, um, set up uh, her own queries, uh, combining operators, combining uh, data sets and uh, uh, complex uh, um, query processing. The data check-in uh, where uh, a directed uh, uh, methodology is being followed, which enables end user to onboard data, semantically align data, and then store the data in the distributed Sibel storage. And the visualization, uh, which actually uh, exploits data uh, as part of uh, uh, the result set of a query or data as part of uh, an analysis performed through the composer, a machine learning or an AI deep learning uh, analysis, and can be further visualized by means of uh, uh, charts, pies, or, or through visualization means that uh, the end user um, uh, defines. And uh, uh, that's all uh, from my side. I will be glad to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, Sophia. Um, I don't know if the, um, there are some, uh, are there some questions from uh, uh, the audience uh, in the chat? No, at this moment, I have just uh, one one question. It's, it's more related to my curiosity. Um, which is the the order of magnitude of uh, data sets you have in your pilots? Uh, uh, I mean, it's uh, terabytes, uh, petabytes. Just curiosity. Uh, to be honest, currently we are working with uh, some hundreds of uh, gigabytes. Uh, at the same time, and uh, until the review, we were focusing to have most of the services uh, there. And in the upcoming period, we will also focus on the volume of the data, uh, augmenting up to um, uh, uh, more hundreds of uh, um, uh, gigabytes. Uh, in order to have uh, uh, the full, the first prototype, integrated uh, prototype, uh, and uh, due to COVID restrictions, uh, as uh, our data are being directly collected from the fields of uh, monitoring and measuring um, IoT um, uh, metrics, um, we, are, we are trying to keep a good balance between uh, data volumes and uh, uh, the, the actual uh, uh, field um, uh, sending people to, to, to research areas or uh, um, uh, fields that uh, need to be uh, collected. So currently uh, we are uh, uh, managing uh, hundreds of uh, gigabytes with the ambition to um, multiply by uh, three, four factor um, in the upcoming period. That's good. Thank you. Also um, in this direction, we also are exploiting uh, GPU capabilities actually to parallelize and speed up uh, uh, um, uh, several training uh, tasks. Uh, so I think Sibel uh, uh, is a team that is getting uh, uh, mature uh, as the the project is uh, progressing. Uh, although we also fa we we face um, uh, uh, difficulties due to COVID uh, restrictions and uh, the the restriction in um, in traveling and um, having measurements from the fields of operation. Okay, thank you, uh, Sophia. Uh, if there are no more questions from the, the audience, uh, uh, maybe we can uh, we have still uh, uh, a little bit of time before uh, closing the, the workshop. So maybe I can uh, ask uh, the, um, the coordinators. Uh, unfortunately, there is uh, no uh, Jean Thomas, but um, from Jan, uh, Steven, uh, and Monica, uh, to, to share the, their ideas on uh, how to uh, move uh, further 
because this the the, la, the last uh, last year of uh, for uh, all these uh, four projects uh, but uh, of course uh, um, uh, all of us uh, think about uh, how to uh, move on and exploit the the experience uh, matured during the the project uh, uh, for uh, for next project or a collaboration so how do you what do you think about uh, of this uh, maybe uh, Stephen can start and uh... um, yeah like I, I think you know because these ICT projects they're all these large-scale pilots um, we're looking to really really kind of showcase how HPC uh, can be used outside of you know this kind of you know scientific experiment area and, and to have kind of real applications and i think these projects show that um you know ju just just looking at, at the application areas for these projects that hpc has a lot of potential it still has a has, has a long way to go to get much more accessible like you know if, if you look at some of the services that aws offer they've, they've obviously you know they've, they've billions and billions of euros push behind them but they've done a, a good job of, of making kind of cloud computing accessible to these systems but still there's there, there's a long way to go to get a HPC system they, they probably would claim that they have some HPC capabilities but really they're just offering nodes with, with graphics processors and they're, they're no really they're no more accessible than some of the HPCs out there and um, one of the, I guess we're probably going to be you know, involved in this this upcoming meeting to look at a, a book that that's kind of detailing our experiences in, in, in this this journey as well. And I think that's a really really good step, and it's 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 something that that um, I'm really happy to hear about as well. That there's potentially this kind of book coming up that we can contribute chapters to, which would be kind of detailing um, some some of the the application areas and, and some of the challenges that we've been looking at. Um, I think like with regards kind of future research as well, um, there's, you know, there's, there's still a lot, uh, there's still a, a good distance to go with regards uh, leveraging different kinds of, of machine learning on HPC environments like, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning is, is changing so fast. Um, perhaps it's, it's, uh, it's evolving faster than some of the HPCs can keep up with, um, so it's 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 almost looking at kind of what's what's the next generation of HPCs that are that are coming up, and, and can we make them more accessible than than what the current systems are? That's I guess some some thoughts I have in the area. Yeah. Do you see any point of connection or collaboration with the other uh, big projects? Uh, for for Cybel, yeah, I, I think I think it's very interesting to see like Cybel. What we looked at was more kind of HPC abstractions. Um, so we were kind of taking you know existing HPCs almost you know the, we don't have to change much of what the HPC is, but what we're doing is we're we're, we're making it uh, we're, we're putting this layer on top of HPCs. But what I see in some of the other projects is you're you're kind of developing some of the mechanics within the HPC to make them more efficient and, and, and to, to, to use them um, more effectively. I think there could be a, an exercise in seeing, can some of our abstractions could be, could, uh, you know, be applied in some of the other projects and equally can some of the innovations in the other projects be applied in into the precision agriculture area. I think that would be an, a, kind of an interesting conversation to have at least. Thank you, Stephen. Uh... What is your opinion, uh, Diaz, uh, Monica? Yeah, yeah. So let me let me go point by by point regarding I uh, the the um, collaboration. Besides the the collaboration, you know, within uh, more in the focusing more on the dissemination part. I think we are what. From what I heard today, we are in, we're starting you know, in the middle of pilots, uh, most of us affected also by, by the COVID. Um, 
Uh, I don't know if some of you will or will be applying for an extension. This is, for example, something we have to decide in our next plenary meeting at the end of the month. Uh, but I was I was thinking that since it's uh, the convergence is so a hot topic, and we have uh, such a different use cases covering most of the areas. Uh, I was wondering if to, to organize um, something more oriented to show really um, results of the project. I mean, demos more, more in the, the success cases. So to really show the, the European community that, hey, people, this works. These two works can converge and they present benefits. And, and to the industry also because as Stephen was telling, saying there is a lot of abundance in HPC, but for example, I come from a company, uh, HPC, it's what, mostly? And nowadays there are, um, H, but HPC is more common. And uh, nowadays, if you go to a public band, uh, cloud vendor, they offer HPC instances, but the industry does not, does not know how to use them, for example. So knowing that these instances are available, this, I mean for industry, of course, for searches or on other HPC infrastructures that are available or there are being offered to, to research and nonprofit institutions. For industry, I think it's, it's very useful that we show success case in specific um, fields. So I was thinking for the we were thinking about, it, it was not planned originally, so I don't know if I'm, uh, <laughs> overlapping or, or my dissemination leader, we cut my head, but we were uh, exploring the idea of making some kind of webinars or, or, or showcasing demos. So I was thinking that maybe not in that stage, but once we start having, you know, things are very freely to look and easy to understand, I think this will be a very good thing to do among the different projects. That's one common thing I, I have in my mind. Also for webinars, the uh, BDBA is also always asking or offering the possibility to organize webinars. So I think if all of us join, we have more, more power more power to attract people that if it's just web, webinar from the developed results, uh, Lexi results or uh, Deep Health results or Evolve. So I think that if we join in this kind of uh, organization of more events, it's easier to organize because now I, I guess Alberto have a lot of uh, workload for organizing this. So I guess this can be more spread and more fair for everyone to, to distribute the workload and, and we can take advantage of our collaboration. Uh, then the, uh, regarding the, the, the future research, I have something in my mind and I've totally forgot. So I don't remember exactly, Stephen. Your your last your last uh, your last point was because I had something in my mind. Yeah. So I guess I, I, I was talking about um. Well, there's a couple of things I mentioned. One was we have just new techniques in artificial intelligence and and um, making sure that uh, you know H HPCs can can keep up with that, um, and another item I mentioned was poten potentially like to see if the HPC abstractions that are being developed in Cybell can be applied in, in, in other use cases, potentially in, in some of the other projects here. Uh, and even if, if we could build perhaps abstractions over some of the, the innovations that are happening within the HPC, because we're very much kind of a, a layer above the HPC and, and kind of building adapters into it. Um, now I remember. I remember now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jog on your memory. You know, it's the eight of the hour. I don't know, but I totally <laughs> forgot, just to, be, just to be honest. So I was thinking that uh, considering this like cross uh, relationship uh, and, and more in the developments, I was thinking something similar. We have this toolkit that can be applied to any other sector. It's a uh, deep learning. Uh, it, uh, we, we will be having uh, some um, um, school and some techniques to, to use it. So, and we were also exploring the idea to, since it's already offered publicly, 
to at, the, at some stage start uh, making more dissemination of it so to get the external users to test it. Mm -hmm. And before the project ends, tell us these words is does it work or whatever. Yeah. And, and I'm not an expert in HPC. This is the part I'm more uh, weak. I'm more in the, in the AI part. But I, I guess it also could be interesting to have a more in-depth conversation or if some of the developments for all these layers, for example, that CBLA is developing, we can, we can also try to, to use or, or, or try to test. The, yeah. the, for me, all of these collaborations are really interesting. But the only thing I have to point out is the risk I see also, that is that we don't have resources to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, when coordinating that sometimes it's difficult to commit to make more than was originally planned. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the risk I see for, for that kind of collaborations, whether I consider very interesting and they, you know, they see the, the, the commission and our operating officers will be like, oh, I'm terrified, but there is a risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, which is your uh, opinion, uh, Jan, from the, also from the perspective of our Super Computing Center? Yeah. <laughs> okay. From the Alexis perspective, I think that uh, what I saw today on the presentations, uh, it was very interesting and I can find some, uh, some points for maybe future discussions uh, for <laughs> during the project or after the project. In Sibel, I would like to, for example, know more about your workflow orchestration, how, how you at the end manage it, uh, Kubernetes and uh, HPC schedules together. And also uh, security was mentioned several times, so maybe for future discussion about this topic will be interested. For health, I think that here, for, for me, it was very interesting what we have presented and the security aspect, maybe we can start discuss for future project, future cooperation with the security layer, because uh, in the Lexis, we put a big emphasis on the security. So sometimes uh, it, it took a lot of time to create federated infrastructure, to manage how to connect HPC center with Lexis identity on the secure way. Now we are working with encryption stuff and so on. So this is something for what for science is sometimes not important when we are doing the experiments, but uh, when uh, you would like to go to live, it is very, very important to have a secure secure layer so maybe we can share some knowledge or thinking about the future how to how to co collaborate uh, on this topic so it looks very interesting and ai if you will have a very nice software it will be open source definitely i can promote it uh, on our hpc center yeah to to deploy and to promote uh, across the users it's it's the same for all projects as hpc center if you will guys uh, give us some uh, some software stack which we can deploy on the infrastructure with tutorials we can do it and help you with uh, with exploitation of uh, of the phase of this phase then for for uh, evolve uh, the, and the presentation was mentioned the dusk uh, so i don't know if somebody from evolve is still here or not probably no but maybe i will i will chat with john thomas because uh, what we did on uh, on it for i was optimization of the core of the dust scheduler so uh, we are now using for heterogeneous uh, for orchestration on the cluster our own own orchestrator inside the dusk so maybe it can be interesting uh, for for the evolve project to discuss about this and uh, i saw more so i very i'm very happy about, about the presentation and i think i think that we can find the overlap for the future co collaborations uh, so uh, so this is one point from the hpc center perspective uh, what is important and what will be important, I think, in the next phase is that HPC centers are not thinking now only about HPC, but also HTC uh, and how throughput computing is uh, the very important. Uh, Sibel mentioned the presentation open stack and hyperparameter search. This is something what uh, definitely now can be executed on the environments as we have. For example, the connection to the future Euro HPC clusters can be maybe interesting also for you. And what we will have on IT for I will be the cluster. And this is similar across the Europe, I, I think. The future cluster will have not only HPC partition, but also the cloud partition. And the locality of this cloud partition to HT, HPC will be very important because by this you can transfer very, very fast data, mainly, for example, in AI. 
from the training ferries, from the GPUs, you can transfer the models to the cloud on, on in one location and use it for inf inference. Yeah. So this uh, this uh, I think that this future of the clusters will be heterogeneity. Yeah? It's uh, about the workshop is about the heterogeneity and so on. And yeah. this topic will be the important. And for the Lexis, what we will do in the next phase, and then I totally agree that some workshop about the results will be interested at the end of the projects, because we will open, we already open open call. By this, I hope that we will validate our platform by, with more cases. And then we would like to have the communication about this to, to present uh, what, uh, what we learn from our pilot and so on. You will have a lot of results from your project. So some, uh, some, uh, some uh, booth on some conference which we will prepare together or share somehow. We can be, can be interesting things. I don't know if uh, at the, at the as supercomputing uh, will be something as was from the, on the last years. IT4I will be with Lexis, I hope, on the supercomputing. So maybe we can share some slots, some hours with you for presenting. This is something what I can start to discuss with uh, our communication department. Yeah, and um, we can find more possibilities. What we are thinking now inside the Lexis is if we can organize a workshop on the supercomputing. So if you are interested also in this, maybe Alberto, we can open it the next Monday in, in, in South Zelex, inside the Lexis that uh, this workshop maybe can be not only about the Lexis and the data management, but you can provide to us also some inputs. Mm. Yeah, we cannot guarantee that it will be accepted. It's super computing, it's not easy, but it, can, it is another possibility. We can uh, just start uh, yeah. let's see. What happened? Uh, uh, I think that uh, this is the the first step for uh, try to uh, find the convergence, uh, not mm -hmm. only from the uh, technological perspective, but also from the um, the vision that different project uh, uh, projects have, uh, because uh, um, the European Commun Commission uh, uh, started with a call, ICT eleven uh, a call asking for um, solutions that, uh, and platforms that provide this kind of convergence. And uh, uh, in my uh, humble opinion, uh, we, we came up with four different uh, um, platforms that has some common uh, um, aspects, but uh, uh, they also have their own uh, specific specificities. So um, uh, it will be interesting to try to uh, and large not only around the, the Europe, uh, the European uh, uh, community, but uh, also to maybe uh, exploiting uh, uh, supercomputing uh, uh, as an opportunity to, to spread around the world <laughs> um, our, our, our technical solution. Uh, I think this is a good, uh, good, uh, good idea. Okay. Uh, Alberto, this yeah. is Sofia. One comment from uh, yeah. uh, my side. Uh, I'm sure there are common um, ecosystems and landscapes within this project, and we might uh, uh, discuss how some convergence or some uh, abstracted uh, uh, layers could also serve uh, to see the solution um, uh, as a whole. This could be. Uh, a nice vision for, for the upcoming uh, years. Uh, as um, Monica said, these projects have been heavily disseminated to, through BDVA. Um, so it, it, it would be also nice actually to somehow converge on our similarities and uh, uh, only try to find uh, these delta aspects that need also to be uh, taking into consideration for a seamless um, offering uh, as a, a large scale uh, test beds uh, delivered uh, to the pilots. One is this. The other that uh, uh, we discussed within Sibel in the last uh, plenary uh, and also within the need uh, to make the platform more available to the end users to validate them uh, was uh, uh, somehow to set up a playground having some minimum resources underneath, but all the functionalities in the foreground and uh, letting the users 
uh, start playing somehow with the several tools because all these tools are not straightforward for the end users, but uh, uh, of course they, they automate their lives and they need a kind of training to uh, 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 check in data, to perform queries or uh, onboard model and perform training, etc. Uh, uh, to, to, um, to my humble opinion, uh, these are not uh, um, um, trivial concepts, the convergence of big data, of HPC and all these um, uh, novelties, uh, and the diversity of uh, the background uh, requires a kind of time uh, in order to consume uh, all this info and migrate uh, and take the next step. Uh, so disseminating all these technologies and uh, uh, getting more people uh, with us as uh, business requirements or as industrial partners or within other synergies with the several teams like uh, Jan uh, or Monica, etc., uh, will somehow enable to explode um, uh, the offerings, the technological offerings, al along with um, the needs from uh, directly from uh, from the business perspective. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sophia. Um, I don't know if uh, someone uh, uh, has uh, other comments or uh, want to share uh, um, other ideas. Um, otherwise, um, I will uh, thank you again uh, for uh, uh, for having attended the the, the workshop. And uh, hope we, we will join uh, for another one uh, uh, next year for IPIC, uh, hopefully, but also as Jan uh, and Monica proposed uh, uh, for uh, uh, other venues uh, will be, be, will be fine. So thank you again, enjoy the, uh, the evening and uh, see you next time. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. See you, bye-bye, thank Have you nice again. Evening. Bye-bye.